Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting of uh, Committee of the Whole for Tuesday, September 7th, 2021 to order. First off, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, before we approve the agenda, I'd like to uh, extend my congratulations to a local Grimsby business handling, handling specialty for the recent success in winning a fixed price contract from Royal Caribbean. Handling specialty has been operating in Grimsby since 1963 and designs and builds stage lift systems for the entertainment industry. This project, which has been two and a half years in the making, will bring great economic benefit to Grimsby's local economy and its workforce. To the owners and staff of Handling Specialty, myself and council wish you all the best in new, this new exciting endeavor. As Grinsby uh, teachers and students headed back to the classroom today, I would like to extend my best wishes and hope that you have a safe and happy school year filled with new beginnings, friendships, and adventures. As the famous Dr. Seuss said, you're off to great places. Today is your day, your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. So at that, we'll go to the uh, approval of agenda. Mover and seconder, please. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to lift the item, please. Yeah. For discussion. All right. Uh, 4A, the uh, Committee of the Green Minutes, please. Yeah, you can do that um, when we adopt the uh, previous minutes. You just lift okay. it at that time. Thank you. So I have Councillor Frake as a mover. I need a seconder. Councillor Vardy. Moved by Councillor Frake, second by Councillor Vardy. Resolved that the agenda of the Committee of the Whole meeting of September 7th be approved. All in favor? That's carried. Now we move to uh, number four, adoption of previous minutes. Uh, Councillor Vane would like to uh, lift the Grimsby Green Advisory Committee minutes to speak on it separately. Which, which one did you want to lift? The minutes for the Green Committee. Okay. This, oh, what, what part of of the, like which resolution in the uh, in the minutes? Well, I want to speak to the minutes as a whole, and then I'll, I'll pick a specific resolution in there afterwards. Clerk, is that King? This all right. All right. So I got. I have Councillor Vane as the mover, and we need a seconder. Councillor Cadwell. All right, this is the motion to receive, so discussion can start now, Councillor Vane. I just, uh, the reason I wanted to lift this is, is I'm noticing a trend and I'm getting a little concerned. I, and I need some clarification, I guess, more than anything else, but there's like motions in there um, that um, are being passed by an advisory committee and um, they're not being brought to council to be discussed by council other than being brought in as part of the minutes. And um, it just concerns me that they're trying to direct staff to work with an advisory committee. When my understanding from based on what I've seen in the past is these committees are just supposed to bring us suggestions and guidance and stuff like that. And yet we're, they're turning into a mini council and they were not elected, we were. And I just don't think it's right um, especially when you start asking for staff to do things for them. Um, I, I think that's outside the beyond of a committee. And I'm just, I, I'd like some clarification if nothing else, but I think that we need to, uh, we need to look at that seriously because I think the committees are starting to take on council roles. And especially when they're starting to ask staff to work with them and stuff like that, that's our job. I think that's beyond the committee. So I, I have some very serious concerns about this. So I will not be supporting the minutes the way they're put forward. And then I'm curious as to why committees are passing motions and then we're just rubber stamping them. And then they suddenly become something, a, a part of council. That, that to me is not what a committee is supposed to do. So if anybody has something to offer on this, I'd love to hear it, but right now I can't support it. 
Councillor Bothwell. Hey, Mayor Jordan. Um, it's unfortunate that Councillor Vane, you know, started off on the Grimsby Green, then didn't attend any meetings and, and is no longer on the committee um, because he would then understand what the terms of reference for the committee are, which is to work with staff on a number of priority initiatives that um, the council actually uh, supported the Grimsby Green Advisory Committee being created, uh, the members being put on the committee and the terms of reference that are currently in place, which is to work with staff on the deliverables within uh, the strategic priorities of the committee. I'm only a member of the committee. It's unfortunate that um, the chair is not here to speak to it as well, but um, many of the items in the agenda in the minutes are those that have been brought back to us from staff for consideration of the committee. That's how the work is done. And then in liaison with the staff, recommendations are made, uh, ones that re require council approval are brought forward to council as a notice of motion or as a motion, sorry, uh, council for council endorsement, similar to the Heritage Committee. Um, in this particular agenda, um, a lot of items were referred. So I'm not too sure which specifically Councillor Vane is concerned about. Um, we had a number of speakers at that meeting. Uh, we had staff doing presentations. So I, I'm just not too, con I'm just a little very confused as to where Councillor Vane's going with what he expects a committee to do um, without, it sounds like he wants to tie their hands on everything. So can I ask um, Director Sweeney, who is very familiar with the terms of reference and the role of staff, perhaps to speak to how the committee structure works and um, what the role of the committee and the role of staff are according to the terms of reference. That would probably help clarify for Councillor Vane. Thank you. Sarah, uh, you're not on my screen, but uh, are you there? It doesn't uh, seem to, it doesn't seem that uh, Sarah Sweeney's here right now. Um, CEO Schlang, you'd like to speak? Mayor, if I could text her quickly, I know she was planning on joining. If we could maybe uh, go to the next item and get her on on board with us. Yeah, well, we have another speaker, so we have Councillor Ritchie. Councillor Ritchie, go ahead. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I guess when I look through it and I I, I see Councillor Vane's concerns, and I might share some of them. Specifically, when I look at something such as the 10 grass cutting and the, the, the resolution says resolve that staff report back to the advisory committee at the October meeting on current policies and procedures and contracted arrangements concerning grass cutting in Grimsby. And I really have a uh, I don't know if that's how that motion's intended to be, but when we start getting into contracts uh, for services that the town offers and we start discussing them at this advisory level. I don't know if that's really appropriate. And I mean, we do have um, policies and procedures and the advisory committee, absolutely. Take a look at the, the policies and procedures. And if they wanna make recommendations, bring that forward to council. But I always thought that staff should always maintain a neutral position. Um, so when the advisory committee wants to bring it forward, they bring it to council and council then would ask staff for a report. I don't know if that's, uh, if that's the intent of that motion. When I look at that particularly, I see some other ones that direct staff, but it's more like, uh, you know, provide recommendations for improved quality tags uh, and so forth. Um, but that's the that's one that's concerning to me. Um, like I said, it's uh, when when the, the motion it says that uh, that staff report to the advisory committee. Staff just reported to council the last meeting, so I don't know why they need to report back to advisory committees, especially on current policies and procedures. Now, if if the advisory committee has questions they'd like to ask about the policies and procedures, then that's a little bit different. Uh, in regards to um, that's not really articulated very well in that motion. And uh, again, when we're talking about contract arrangements, uh, I have an issue um, with those going through an advisory committee. Thank you. Councillor Bothwell. Just for clarification, thank you, Mayor. Uh, that followed a presentation uh, and request by Bruce McKenzie on pollinator habitat 
the intent of the motion was to find out um, whether sloped areas are currently being maintained or not being maintained um, by, by looking at different various areas within the town that are public lands that may be suitable for pollinator habitat. So the intent was to find out what the policies and procedures and contracted arrangements are for grass cutting um, on mainly sloped areas and areas that could possibly be uh, be looked at for potential pollinator habitat. So it was not intended to look at uh, reviewing the contracts or anything like that. It's like, do the contractors actually cut sloped areas and to what height do they cut um, ditches, for instance, sloped ditches, um, and looking at where there might be public areas town within the town that could be suitable for increasing pollinator habitat. So that was the discussion. The way the motion may be written may be a little bit unclear, but that was the intent that staff took away from it was to help identify areas for potential pollinator habitat. Thank you. Councillor Payne. I, I kind of feel a little bit like the committee is trying to do staff work. It um, and, and not to create any commotion here, but a previous committee brought forward a motion that, that turned into a real kerfuffle for us. and. Uh, it's because staff wasn't involved. And I, I'm, I, again, I, I'm still of the opinion, the way I used to watch committees anyways, was they would make suggestions to council, council would debate it, go to staff, do whatever, not do all the work. Like committees are just, in my opinion, are just there to offer guidance, uh, what the community feels, um, that type of thing. I, I think I would rather see this committee focused on more important things like climate change and shoreline restoration. Um, the, the if you if the committee wants to recommend doing pollinators, which I'm a full supporter of, and I, I totally agree, I think it's a wonderful idea. But I think that's something that we should be directing the staff to do, not a committee. Uh, I've seen in the past other committees where they've actually gone out and physically done drive arounds and stuff like that, and I don't agree with that. Uh, it is potentially it's not their job, and that's what we have staff for. And we're really crossing some lines, in my opinion. Just an opinion. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Final comment, um, and then uh, I'd like to call the question just that I think Director Sweeney can come back to Councillor Vane on that. It's unfortunate that Councillor Vane is not on the committee and that he has such strong opinions because had he stayed on the committee, he might have been able to contribute to it um, and, and provide some of that input that he feels is so valuable. For now, we've set the priorities. Uh, staff are working very closely with us. The committee wants to accomplish some things, just like GDAC and every other committee. We want to uh, move the town forward in a positive way. Um, and I think that uh, Director Sweeney can come back with uh, clarification for Councillor Vane. I'd like to call the question. Mayor Sarah Sweeney's on now. All right, um, Sarah, welcome. Apologies for that, everyone. Um, I'm I am a little late coming to this conversation, but from the just that I've heard, if you want just a bit of feedback from my from me, I did miss that last meeting. I had uh, somebody else in my place for it, but my understanding was the discussion was to focus on how we can mitigate and manage some of our grass cutting, maybe not so much focused on contracts, although perhaps the wording needs to be clarified. So I'm happy to take that back to the committee and have a little bit more discussion to sort of refine a little bit more as to what we're going after in terms of the intent, if that's helpful. Thank you, Sarah. All right, the uh, question has been called, so we need a mover and seconder, and we need to vote to call the question. We have mover, Councillor Bothwell, seconder, Councillor Vardy. Point of clarity, Mr. Mayor, what question are we asking here? Just to call the question for the uh, receiving of the advisory committee minutes. I'd like to, uh, I think, all right, I'd like to speak right. further to this. I think there should Move be another motion. We just heard uh, from the point director. of order. The question's been called. The question's been called, Councillor Ritchie. Uh, moved by Councillor Bothwell, second by Councillor Vardy. Resolved that the question be called on the adoption of the previous minutes. Councillor Bothwell. Sorry. Yeah, recorded vote, Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Dunstall is absent. Councillor Frake? Yes. Councillor Cabwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? No. Councillor Sharp?
Yes. Councilor Vane? No. Councilor Vardy? Sorry, I didn't hear you, Councilor Vardy. Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's carried. Right. Now we move to the uh, again point of clarity, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, the uh, um, I'm moving to the uh, Grinsby Green Advisory Committee uh, minutes. Yeah, okay, I'd like to lift an item, please. Well, I thought we lifted the whole minutes. Yes, we did. So. so then, that's my question: is what is the what was the question to be called when we we're in discussion? There was no motion on the floor. To receive the Grinsby Green Advisory Committee minutes. We let, we voted to lift the minutes, did we not? Or we open up discussion? So how do we call the sure. question when we don't have anything on the floor? So what was on the floor is a motion to receive the minutes of Grinsby Green Advisory Committee of August 11th. So just to receive it. Right, and the, and the minutes were lifted, corrected? We don't really lift unless there's a rec uh you lift an item, you don't lift yeah. the whole minute. So right. So so that but we you know the item was was under under discussion. So was the question to be called to end that discussion on that item? It was it because the whole minutes were uh were lifted, we were we discussed the whole minutes. So essentially we uh, this resolution was the one that was lifted, in my opinion. All right, so uh, moved by Councillor Vane, second by Councillor Cadwell, resolved that the Grinsby Green Advisory Committee of August 11th be received. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Freight? Yes. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? No. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councilor Vane? No. Councilor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's carried. Now we move to item seven, administration and finance. Uh, item 7.1A, report FIN 2125, appointment of auditors. Uh, Melanie? Good evening, Council. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. Hello. So the report in front of you this evening is uh, one that we're looking to appoint town auditors for the 2021 year end and 2022 year end. With the completion of our recent financial statements, we're looking forward to 2021 year end already. I can't, I can't believe I'm saying that, but we did go back to school today. So that means we're, we're getting there very quickly. This report is recommending that we reappoint Grant Thornton, our current auditors for a two year term. This is in alignment with the town's current work plan being focused on the pandemic response well into 2022 and our existing relationship with Grant Thornton, which I believe will benefit the town in the next two years as we continue to navigate some uncertain financial results and changing landscapes. Grant Thornton is well-established firm, um, both across the country as well as locally, with lots of municipal experience. They're currently the longstanding audit, um, auditors of five of the 12 local municipalities in Niagara. Um, and I believe that they would continue to serve Grimsby well over the next uh, few years. Support of this recommendation would allow staff to move forward with planning and preparation of the 2021 audit activities. Certainly the report provides more context on, on this recommendation, but um, I think that's a high level overview and I'm happy to address any questions as required. All right, thank you, Melanie. We'll get a mover and seconder and then we'll start questions. Moved by Councillor Frank, second by Councillor Ritchie. Uh, Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, I did pose this question to um, uh, the Director of Finance, Melanie, um, earlier. Um, in the report, it, it states that 
the contract was renewed by staff for three additional years from 2018 to 2020. And the response I received was there was no record of council approval for that um, three year extension. Um, do you, can you just confirm who signed that? Was it the, the, the Mayor, Mayor Bentley um, or the CAO that signed that extension, Melanie? Yep, I sure can. Through you, uh, Mayor Jordan, uh, it was signed off by the treasurer at the time. Only the treasurer on the, you're talking about the agreement with uh, for the extension. Okay. That's correct. The engagement letter that was signed for the three-year agreement with Grant Thornton was one signature only, and it was the treasurer in August of 2018. And you couldn't find any emails or correspondence directing the treasurer to make that engagement? So, so through the mayor, I can't say I searched emails holistically. I did my best looking through all of our drives to find any reports, documents, quotes. I spoke with Grant Thornton to ask of their understanding of how this went down. Um, they did say that they emailed the quotes in, um, that they, they were with staff for um, over six months before the final engagement letter was signed. Um, and that's the extent of, I, I confirm with the clerks, we looked at all the agendas. That's really the research we did on it. Thank you. Um, considering the value of this extension, and we're going back now to um, originally 2015 when there was a procurement process, I'm assuming at that time under the old rules, um, considering we're looking at like seven years now uh, with uh, potentially with this company, I think that even from 2015 to today, um, I don't think, I think that it's important that we do a procurement process and open procurement, uh, not a sole source, non-competitive. Um, especially the value being over 100,000 again, and cumulatively, this uh, this company having the uh, the contract for such a length of time, um, it doesn't mean just because they're good at what they do, it doesn't mean that um, it's a status quo that you continue to, to engage them. I'm a little concerned that um, you talk about efficiencies and that it's with COVID and that it'll direct your, your time, but yet in the letter from Grant Thornton, they talk about the agreed upon assistance from staff in respect to the quote he's providing is, has been negotiated already apparently uh, with staff um, that there will be, uh, the fees are based upon the assumption that there'll be no material change of our assignment and the nature of the transactions entered into by them. And upon receiving agreed upon assistance from staff, and on the understanding that the responsibilities of the auditors will be limited to the audit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then it also says if town staff take on the preparation of the draft financial statements complete with all required disclosure, notes and schedules, a discount of 15% of the above fees will be provided. So it's almost like there's been, you know, in order for this number to come forward, staff have already negotiated with this vendor for, for this to move forward. And I'm concerned that if council now says we want an open procurement process, um, that it has to be apples to apples. And if you're offering these types of um, supports to the auditor, then those same supports need to be offered to any vendor that's that's uh, in the RFP, that's proposed for the RFP um, in, that, in that scope of work. So um, to me, this is almost like a bit of a conflict because you've almost reached out and done negotiations in advance of council making a decision on this. So I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with that, number one. Um, I would have liked to have seen it just be, you know, we get the information and then we direct. And then if there's negotiations to occur, like, or whatever, that would be in the RFP, what the, what the workload of staff would be, but it's already been determined that you're going to offer assistance to them. So I'm, I'm supporting open procurement, I think, for the value and for the length of time that the company has been, um, uh, been, been uh, in contract with the town, that it's timely that we use the new procurement model and the new procurement process. And I don't think it will disadvantage or make any more work for staff, considering that they've already uh, committed to doing a, a bunch of behind the scenes work anyway, to ensure that whichever auditor is appointed will um, have the benefit of the staff assistance. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm supporting an open procurement for this value and because of the, the methods that the previous procurement policies uh, uh, were, how they, how they came about. Thank you. Councillor Cadwell. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. Uh, I'm not against procurement policies, uh, but I know that uh, under Grimsby Power, uh, we have, uh, set up an agreement with the uh, KP, KPMG, who does the audit. Uh, staff is very happy with the work. 
And as a director on GPI, I staff's recommendation, uh, they're the ones that are involved. And uh, so anyways, this is to me, it's just, uh, it's just some good housekeeping, which I, uh, I, I support the uh, director of finances report. Uh, again, I'm only gonna, I'm not gonna get into particulars, but we had an auditor for a lot of years doing the uh, audits for the town of Grimsby. I'm not gonna mention any names, but it was the treasurer at the time made a recommendation that we change. So, so what do we do? We, we listen to the treasurer and we changed the auditors way back a couple of terms ago, I think. So again, I'm supporting this, uh, this report from staff because they're working with the auditors. Thank you. Councillor Barton. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to add, it's not that we're not accepting report from staff. Um, but I, I just think it's good, uh, good government practice to, you know, to go to tender and uh, evaluate what everyone has. Um, staff can still make their recommendation uh, once they've seen the, uh, the offers that come in. But I think given the amount of money um, that it really should be a fair playing field and we, be, you know, going up to tender. Thank you. Councillor Cadwell, did you want to speak again or? Okay. All right, seeing no further questions. Moved by Councillor Frake, second by Councillor Ritchie. Be it resolved the report FIN 21-25, appointment of auditors dated September 7th, 2021 be received and the firm Grant Thornton LLP Chartered Professional Accountants be appointed as a town auditor for an additional two year term representing fiscal years of 2021 and 2022 and staff be directed to prepare the necessary bylaw. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Dun uh, Councillor Frake? No. Councillor Catwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Rain? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. That's a tie, so it's defeated. All right, moving to uh, item 7.2, resolutions, report CAO 21-15, council memorandum regarding September 30th as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. CAO? Thank you, Mayor, and thanks for allowing me to speak to this council. As you know, the, we're recommending that the Town of Grimsby support and endorse the proposed resolution for municipal recognition for September 30th as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. As proposed by AMO, the appendix has um, the AMO uh, motion enclosed with it. Uh, we will be doing a, a number of things for staff on September 30th, education, orange shirt day, um, some promotional activities to make sure that our staff is aware of, of and acknowledge the day as, a, as critical for, for the nation. So we're just uh, requesting that the council support the AMO resolution in Appendix A and uh, declare this at the National Day for the Indigenous Community. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, seeing uh, no que questions or comments, if we have the mover and seconder. Uh, oh, Councillor Vane, you'd like to comment? Can't see you, but I see your hand. There you are. I believe he's muted. Um, Councillor Vane, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, the uh, my understanding is the federal government has, has uh, declared this a statutory holiday. But what the CAO Schlang has said kind of confused me a little bit. Are we declaring this as a statutory holiday for the staff, or are you saying we're just going to do special things on that day to recognize the Indigenous um, loss? I, I just need clarification on that, CAO Schlang, if you don't mind. Through your mayor yeah. to Councillor Vane. No, I'm not declaring it a statutory holiday on that day. The whole purpose of the day is for educational components. 
I am considering perhaps a Lou day at some other point, but it would defeat the purpose of, you know, being open for the facilities, you know, sort of promoting and educating both staff and the community of, of the events of that day and the importance of that day. But I'm not declaring it a holiday for the staff on that day. But I might be considering a loo day at some other point. But we want our facilities to be open, so we're promoting uh, this. This because the federal government has declared it as a statutory holiday for their staff. That's why I'm asking. I'm just curious. That's all. But thank you for clarifying. Thank you, CAO. Uh, seeing no further questions, moved by Councillor Bain, second by Councillor Ritchie. Resolved that report CAO 21-15, Council Memorandum regarding September 30th as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation be received, and whereas the Truth and Reco Reconciliation Commission released its final report on June 2nd, 2015, which included 94 calls to action to redress the legacy of residential schools and advance the process of Canadian reconciliation. And whereas the recent discoveries of remains of and unmarked graves across Canada have led to increased calls for all, all levels of government to address the recommendations in the TRC's call to action. And whereas all Canadians and all orders of government have a role to play in reconciliation. And whereas recommendation number 80 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called upon the federal government in collaboration with the Aboriginal peoples to establish as a statutory holiday, a national day for truth and reconciliation to ensure that public commemoration of the history and legacy of residential schools remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. And whereas the federal government has announced September 30th, 2021 as the first national day for truth and reconciliation, national orange shirt day, and statutory holiday. Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Town of Grimsby does hereby commit to recognizing September 30th as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, National Orange Shirt Day, by sharing the stories of residential school survivors, their families, and communities. Uh, well, let's have a recorded vote for this. Rothwell? Councillor Frake? Yes. Councillor Catwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. I see you nodding yet. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's Carrie. All right, moving to uh, resolution 7.2B uh, in indoor swimming pool. I have Councillor Frank as the mover and I, before, seconder. You read, before you read that. Councillor Bothwell. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Frank. I've asked uh, Sarah to make a slight revision to that. Uh, if Sarah is there, maybe she can, she can read it. I, I wanted to eliminate uh, part of the therefore. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you have that. So when you read it, you read it as per the revision. I believe I have the updated uh, copy. So. Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I'll just read the whole thing. Yeah. All right. Moved by Councillor Frank. Oh, Councillor. I'll read it, then we'll discuss it, then we can. Uh, I'll read it again. Uh, whereas the town of Grimsby is a vibrant, growing community with pent up demand for year round aquatic programs for all ages of residents. And whereas the town of Grimsby swimming is a popular activity that is enjoyed by all ages and indoor pools should be a core residential and health related service. And whereas the in recent surveys around the country, 60% of households participate in swimming at indoor aquatic facilities, including learn to swim, special interests, for example, diving, synchronized swimming, et cetera, swimming leadership, aquatic fitness, and community rentals. And whereas the current Lions Cub community pool is only accessible two to three months of the year, and because it's an outside pool, it is also hampered by weather, thus, thus a closure factor even in summer. And the YMCA is private and expensive and inaccessible for most residents. Therefore, our residents must travel outside of Grinsby in the off season. And whereas learning 
how to swim can be a lifesaver and death by drowning continues to be one of the top killers of children in the summer months. And while accidents do happen, giving children a place to take swimming lessons close to their homes can save lives in the future. Whereas our community is on Lake Ontario and according to the national statistics, drowning is the second leading cause of unintentional injury related death to children ages one through 14 years. So it is crucial that all children learn how to swim at a young age. And whereas indoor aquatic programs can also help people who have arthritis, diabetes, and similar conditions who are normally prevented from doing heavy workouts, an indoor year-round swimming pool and aquatic program is the most recognized activity for people with these ailments because water supports 90% of the body weight. Therefore, be it resolved that council directs staff to provide a report on costing of an indoor pool slash aquatic programs in the town of Grimsby and any possible sites, including the Peach King Center. Councillor Bain. Um, I, I, I support the idea that Councillor Frakes bringing forward, and I know this is something that somebody's been raising a lot of stuff about lately, but um, I, I think there's a couple of concerns I have here. First of all, I'm in a huge supporter of getting a pool. When I was the chair of the Parks Committee, I, um, I used to talk to Sarah Sweeney about this all the time. I, I love having a pool. But as I previously stated, I don't believe we have the room in the Peach King Center because uh, Racquetball Ontario has been um, reaching out to us quite a bit, trying to just save the small racquetball courts, let alone anything else. Um, we don't have the space for it, the Peach King Center. Also, I heard in the past there were concerns that this would harm the YMCA um, because it would take away from their pool. I, I think having access to a pool is a great idea. I don't think this is the way to do it. We have, it says uh, in uh, Councillor Frick's motion that 60% um, of the people support this, but 100% of the people are gonna be on the hook for the tax increase. And it will be huge for a pool because pools are very expensive, not only to build, uh, we've got to find somewhere to put it. And then the cost of the maintaining the pool is hugely expensive uh, and staffing it. What I would prefer to see, and, and it's up to Councillor Frick if he wants to change his motion to add this, I would prefer to see the staff um, see if we could work out a working arrangement where we could subsidize the YMCA. My understanding is they have day passes, but you have to pay for the whole center. So if the day pass costs, I don't know, 10 or $15, I would rather see the town subsidize part of that to allow people to have access to the pool as well as the whole YMCA. Uh, and, you know, so we would pay a portion, the person pays a portion as they would with a pool. That to me is a win-win, but I really think that, uh, I think politically, we're going to put ourselves in a bad spot here if we try to bring in a pool. And I've heard there are millions of dollars just to build. And like I said, we don't have the room. So um, anyways, that's just my thought on it. That's all. I'll still support this, but I just don't think it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bain. Just a, a point of clarification. The report here says to provide a costing. Um, and so I, th I really think that... Um, Providing a costing first is 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 something we should look at now, and then we can talk about um, working with the Y on a different level when that time comes. Councillor Frake, thank you, Mayor Jordan. Yeah, first of all, let's not let's not lose the theme of this particular motion. It's to ask staff to cost out the potential of a swimming pool anywhere in Grimsby. Uh, you know, we need to we need to have more control of that type of activity. I do not feel comfortable farming it out to the YMCA. Uh, I don't know if the YMCA is going to be here a year or two years or 10 years. I do not know. And I don't think any of us do. Uh, there's a lot of people in this town who maybe can't afford to go to YMCA. Uh, I don't know if the YMCA can accommodate all the different programs and the timings of these programs for kids. I mean, I don't know if kids, small kids are going to be able to access the YMCA in the evenings or particular parts. So there has to be a very flexible swimming program, an aquatics program, somewhere within Grimsby, hopefully. I mean, but we don't know that yet until we see the costing. Then we can decide whether we can afford it. But the thing is, you know, we need to have some flexibility around that particular particular program. So, you know, let's, let's do one step at a time, move to the next step after. So this is the first step, I think. And with, with Sarah's help, uh, maybe we can get past that and we can decide you know, whether we can or can't afford it, whether we can subsidize it or get sponsors or whatever the case might be, and then move to the next step. 
So, um, but I do believe that we need a, you know, an indoor swimming pool in Grimsby that is a year round and not like the Lions Club where it's kind of, you know, peri- it's, it's seasonal and it's, um, and no, it's, it's, it, it depends on the weather. Uh, and it's, and it's actually, you know, quite busy and it's, it's, it's overbooked, I think most of the time. So, uh, you know, let's, let's just take the uh, resolution as it is and move from there. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that because I believe some others uh, want to have a word as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Pardee. Uh, thank you very much to you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to say that um, before you give consideration to any kind of idea um, about what to do or where to do, uh, you, need, you need to know all the parameters, like how much would it cost? How much would it cost to build? How much would it cost to operate? So, uh, you know, I think in order, in, in order to look at this in a responsible way, the very first step is to look at what would it cost if we ever decided to go that direction? And all this motion is asking for is, a re- is basically a report on costing and a report on, I guess, feasibility of placement. I mean, you know, maybe we could afford it, but we got nowhere to put it. Um, you know, maybe we've got lots of places to put it and uh, no money to pay for it. But uh, be- before we enter into any conversation about whether or not we have a pool, we need to get this basic information and that's what uh, this motion is calling for. So I support the motion. Councillor Sharp. Thanks, Mayor Jordan. Um, I'm just doing some math here. Uh, so I remember, um, forgive me if I'm wrong with the name, but Mrs. Bennett came and gave a delegation about an indoor pool. And I seem to, on my recollection, remember her saying um, $400,000 per year in operating expense. And um, so I'm doing the math, $400,000 if that was our operating expense. And if we were to say subsidize the $15 day pass at the uh, YMCA to $5, um, that's 10 bucks divided by 10, that's 40,000 day passes per year. And divided by 365, that's 109.5 day passes per day. So we could have almost 110 people, and we could even ask the YMCA to give us a discounted rate if we're going to buy this volume or subsidize this volume of day passes because I think that would really, really increase their um, the use of their pool. I don't know what their, how much their pool is used. but um, So if, if those numbers are correct, then um, you know, we might be able to, for even less than the operating cost of a pool, subsidize the use of the existing YMCA pool, and then we don't have to spend any capital money on um, a uh, on a pool or the whole facility. And then, um, so like five bucks a day, I guess you could go twice in the day, but um, there seems like there might be options. So anyways, I know we're not quite at that yet, so I'll support this motion because um, – you know, we'll get the report back from staff, but just while I have staff's attention, um, if they could look into um, partnerships or subsidizing the YMCA as an option, and if that just by quick number crunching could um, potentially save us some money, that, that'd that be great if, if they could include that for me. Um, so I'll support the resolution. Thanks. Councillor Cadwell. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. And uh, it's an interesting idea. Again, I remember when we had the referendum on a on a voting ballot to the whole community. Uh, it got turned down, but that was then. This is now. I'm just concerned. Uh, I know I was in the uh, Peace King Center today, and uh, Sarah Sweeney's got a nice uh, bulletin board of the looking of, of the future gym edition. Uh, in the lobby there. That's great. Looks good. So I guess what I'm a little concerned with is is how much time this would uh, take of staff to do it. Because right now, we're uh, very, very busy with the uh, the uh, the addition to the Peace King Center. So uh, if I'd like to hear from Sarah on that. If she has the time to do that, I think then that's fine. Uh, 
th this all seemed to come to life after we got the uh, just over $16 million grant for the addition of the Peach King Center. And I guess, uh, again, a question to uh, Sarah Sweeney, because the submission that, that you put forward to the province, and it was in the province obviously looked at it and granted us this funding, would a, a pool, because it sounds to me that uh, the, uh, the theme of all this is, is because of the 16 million and maybe adding that to the Peace King Center. So how does that work with regards to the, our submission to the province of, of what, we, what they approved, what we're planning to do? Yeah, that's it for now, uh, Sarah, thank you. Sarah? Good evening, Mayor Jordan, members of council. I'm happy to answer a few of those questions. In terms of time to put together some content, yes, it certainly would take some time, uh, but I do think there is some value in doing that exercise. If you recall in the master plan, the number one indoor recreation need expressed by the community was, was an indoor pool. And so I think it is worth at least exploring uh, that point a little bit further and what options could exist now or in the future. So I, I do think there is value in, in that, definitely. In terms of the grants, uh, we were clearly funded for a very specific project with a specific scope and a specific dollar amount. So I don't think that's an open-ended option for us. Uh, could you add to the scope of the project at a full cost? Perhaps, um, you know, and again, that would be a, a further conversation we could explore as well, but it was, it is pretty specific in the scope that they did approve. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And uh, just to add to, uh, with all the work involved, I think, I do like the idea if the town could work out a, uh, some type of a partnership to, for, to assist people that want to go swimming now. You know, maybe maybe in the future, like I say, we do a referendum and and with the information coming from staff, hey, that might be our next big project. And I, I think that's a great idea. But, you know, I think we've got to take the baby steps on it, get a report from staff. But, you know, uh, I, I just don't want to rush this because I think there's another another temporary solution for swimming, working with the Y. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, just a point of clarification, it's only the direction on this resolution is just to come back with the costing, so it's not to, to move forward with anything. Uh, seeing no further uh, questions or comments, thank you very much, Sarah, for your input. Uh, moved by Councillor Frank, second by Councillor Bothwell. Whereas the town of Grimsby is a vibrant, growing community with pent-up up demand for a year-round aquatic for year-round aquatic programs for all ages of residents. And whereas in the town of Grimsby, swimming is a popular activity that is enjoyed by all ages and indoor pools should be a core recreational health related and health related services. And whereas in recent surveys around the country, 60% of households participate in swimming at indoor aquatic facilities, including learn to swim, special interests, for example, diving, synchronized swimming, swimming leadership, aquatic fitness, and community rentals. And whereas currently the Lions Pool, community pool is only accessible two to three months of the year. And because it's an outside pool, it was also hampered by weather, thus a closure factor even in summer. And the YMCA is private and expensive and inaccessible for most residents. Therefore, our residents must travel outside Grinsby in the off season. And whereas learning how to swim can be a lifesaver and death by drowning continues to be one of the top killers of children in the summer months and while accidents do happen happen given children giving children a place to take swimming lessons close to their homes can save lives in the future whereas our community is on lake ontario and according to the national statistics drowning is the second leading cause of unintentional injury related death to children ages 1 through 14 so it is crucial that all children learn how to swim at a young age and whereas indoor aquatic programs can also help people who have arthritis, diabetes, and similar conditions who are normally prevented from doing heavy workouts in an indoor year-round swimming pool. An aquatic program is the most recognized activity for people with these ailments because water supports 90% of the body weight. Therefore, be it resolved that council directs staff to provide a report on costing of an indoor pool aquatic programs in the town of Grimsby and any possible sites, including the Peach King Center. Recorded vote. Yes. Councillor Frey. Yes. Councillor Cadwell. Yes. 
Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Bain? Yes. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's carried. All right, now we move to uh, item 12, correspondence. All right, we're going to do a um, Niagara Region Memorandum. Mayor Jordan, can I, can, I, can I lift one of those uh, pieces of correspondence? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. Councillor Frick, you'd like to uh, lift something? The, the correspondence. Okay, the actually, we're, we're going to do, do the, the first, first two, and then, then, and then we'll, we'll lift, lift those, those other two. two. Thank you. All right, let's lift the rest of those. Yeah. all right okay so um yeah so this this one we're doing now is the vaccination policy that's the one we're doing all right so um uh i'll read the resolution and then i, I want to speak on it resolve that the correspondence under administration and finance pertaining to niagara region memorandum cao 17-2021 COVID 19 vaccination policy update be received and the staff in consultation with the region of municipality of Niagara to be directed to develop and implement a policy and any required procedures to require all town employees to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 at the earliest opportunity, subject to and in compliance with any applicable legal directives and requirements, including but not limited to applicable human rights obligations, accommodation of employees legally entitled to, titled to accommodation, um, MFIPPA and PHIP and that applicable provisions of the aforementioned vaccination policy include members of council who wish to attend in-person meetings, including committee and council, conduct business on town property or facilities or attend official events in their capacity as town councilor. And, uh, we had this uh, essentially the same resolution at the region. Uh, it did pass, uh, I think, 28 to two that evening. And I really feel it is in our best interest as counselors to, uh, to um, get vaccinated. I, I'm happily vaccinated. Uh, I'm vaccinated both for myself and uh, for the people around me, so. I really feel that that is something that uh, we really need to do for society. Councillor Frank. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. I, I, I'd like to echo that. I, I would like to suggest that we copy and paste this, this resolution that the region has issued there into a, a resolution for Grimsby uh, and, and hopefully we can pass it. I mean, we are going to be expecting folks who come into town hall to be double vaccinated or tested and at some point in time when we open other facilities uh, such as the peace king center for example we're going to be expecting any patrons who come into the center to be also double vaccinated before they they go in to see any of the any of the events in there and or they have to have a uh, uh, test within i think 72 hours or 48 hours so i think we can't we we can start inflicting those type of rules on the community without inflicting them on ourselves as well so I, I like to see this this particular resolution mirror imaged, and I would like to be uh, like to pass that resolution for for Grimsby. Thank you, uh, Mayor Jordan. Thank you. Uh, just as a point of clarification, this resolution, when when we pass it, this this will um, will uh, cover us too. So we will be um, under the same um, rules as the region. The clerk has assured me. That's great. The, the middle yeah, the paper. staff staff will prepare one that that mirrors this. So good. There'd be less work for staff, then. that's great. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Cadwell. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, a question is: Is the region looking at uh, going further with this to their own uh, staff, public works, whatever whatever staff they have working uh, in around with the public? Because uh, there's a lot of uh, Municipalities uh, having discussions about how they may looking to protect their own staff uh, within uh, 
having the uh, double vaccination too. So is there anything from the region that's coming down the pipe at all, Mayor? Uh, the, yeah, this is from the region and it's, it's all staff region wide. So. Oh, this is, okay. All right, thank you. Councilor Ritchie. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. My understanding is we are just, we are receiving this tonight, correct? And then our staff will be looking at a policy, whether it's mirrored or not, and that'll be coming in at a later date, correct? I, so when Clerk. you made the comment, when you made the comment that we're covered by this, uh, I just, I would disagree with that right now because we are receiving this motion or we're receiving yeah. this as information. Yeah. CAO? Through you, Mayor, yes, I would, if the town of Grimsby supports the region's resolution as written, I would like that direction that, you know, from you, from this council, not just receiving it, that, but you actually put the motion in and approve it that, you know, exactly as written by the region. We will probably have to customize it slightly. They have a lot more staff, but we will be following with the region and, and the other municipalities. We'll be working on this together. But I would like the direction from this council that you're supportive of this. So, yes. clerk, you you should be preparing a resolution on yeah. this. Yeah. So the resolution. Sorry, through you. Go ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the resolution is a direction to staff. So council is approving a direction to staff that we consult with the regional municipality of Niagara to develop and implement a policy regarding uh, COVID vaccination. So point of clarity, Mr. Mayor, that was the regional council's uh, motion. So even that's why that's why I'm confused because we're receiving this, but this is um, regional council's direction. So we are not giving direction right now to our staff. We're just receiving this. If the motion says that we're to give direction, then that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But this here is that is, would not be covered to say yes, go do this without a motion on the floor. That's what. That's where I want the clarity. And through you, Mayor, and that's yeah. why I'm asking for yeah. specific voting yeah. by this council. Yeah. Yeah, and the clerk's going to clarify that. Through you, Mr. Mayor. That's, that's exactly what I was trying to do. We can split the question. So the first part is to receive the correspondence from Niagara Region, which is very similar in wording. And the second part is to uh, provide direction to staff, so council to approve a direction to staff to uh, for us to go in and uh, implement a policy. So it's kind of a two-part resolution right now. Councilor Patwa. Councilor Bathwa, I think you're muted. Sorry, thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't know if, uh, to provide clarity on that motion, I don't know if uh, the clerk requires a mover or a seconder, but uh, if Councilor Frake wishes to be a mover, I'll be a seconder on the second part of that. Um, uh, so the receive and then the motion uh, can be put on the floor to that staff be directed, um, similar to number two actually in the memorandum. Uh, from the region, but that staff be directed to develop an implement of policy and they require procedures to require all town employees be fully back town and council town employees and council to be fully vaccinated against COVID at the earliest opportunity subject to so that exact wording except to add town of Grimsby and staff in it. Um, so I'd be more than willing to be a, a seconder on that uh, motion if required to put it on the floor. Thank you. All right, so, so you feel it's covered in that part or do we need to do, yeah. Okay, so yeah, the, the, in the second part of that resolution, there is a direction for us to implement policy and it includes uh, uh, staff and council. Councilor Sharp. Thanks, Mayor Jordan. I won't be supporting this resolution um, I know that the vaccination, the vaccinations are um, 
not mandatory in Ontario or in Canada. And um, so people have the right to choose um, what they do and wh what, what type of medical treatments they take. So uh, <laughs> the province and um, through the private businesses and now through the region and potentially the town of Grimsby are, are making these rules and these regulations to compel and coerce people to make decisions that, that the province and the region and the town is not allowed to force people to do. So essentially the resolution makes it so difficult for people to make a choice that, um, that it kind of forces the person's hand. And uh, I know that in Ontario, according to the, the statistics, there's about 77% of people that are vaccinated. And um, that's like 23% that are not. So you're talking one in five people. So if you look to your neighbors on both sides of you, you know, there's um, at least one or two of them. When you're sitting at your home, looking at your neighbor, husband and wife, and maybe their kids, um, some of them are not vaccinated and some of them uh, will be essentially discriminated by this. And um, I understand that there are some uh, um, exceptions and, um, but like the exception kind of makes it the discrimination. I mean, having to go and apply to do something, having to um, stand outside. It's like, so it's like not making the town hall um, fully accessible to people that have mobility issues and then telling the people that with mobility issues that they can attend by other means. And um, we would never do that. And so to someone who makes a decision about their own body and um, that we say, Hey, no, you, you can be exempted and you can be, um, you can be accommodated. We'll see you online or we'll do, it's like you would never do that to other groups of people. And for some reason, it seems to be okay. I don't know if it's if it's legal, and I wonder if maybe we should consult with our legal before this, and uh, and see what what potential if if we could potentially be be in any legal disputes over this. And anyways, I, I won't support it, and I don't think that the council should. This is a personal decision for for people, for residents, and um, citizens of Ontario and Canada. So um, I won't be, I'll ask the, my council and my colleagues um, not to support this. Thank you. Councillor Ritchie. Thank you to you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, you know what, when I look at this policy, I think it lacks in two areas. One, uh, evidence is coming out that if you've had COVID, you're three to six times more protected than anyone vaccinated. And we don't allow any testing so if people have had COVID to show that proof. And I think that's with the amount of cases throughout the entire province, I think that's a direction that needs to be considered. Uh, the second point that I make is, um, is with that too, is that uh, again, we're looking at testing individuals who aren't vaccinated, but we know very well with the D variant that vaccinated people can carry and can transmit COVID. So yes, they sit there and they say that that uh, yeah. that yeah. those individuals uh, are are their symptoms are a lot less. But when you're looking at studies out of Israel, which is about two months ahead of everyone, 74% of hospitalizations out of an 84% fully vaccinated country, 74% of hospitalizations were fully vaccinated. So I have no. I, I sit there and look, and all I sit there and say is that if we're going to be doing antigen just testing where fully vaccinated people are, are, are more asymptomatic and their symptoms are supposed to be less severe, I think we should be protecting everyone and everyone should be tested for an, for an antigen test. That's how I look at it. And that way there, the rules will be in place for everyone. And I have no problem. And that's where I'd like to see us go. And now we're also learning about the new variant coming out, the MU, it's in 45 states. And right now the stats are showing that the vaccination is that this MU is vaccine resistant. The vaccine doesn't work against it. And it's already in 45 states in the US. So those are some of the things that I think we need to consider when we're looking at a policy. 
yes, I understand that a policy, um, something might be better than nothing, but at the same time, there's many, there's lots of data out there that we need to, to consider instead of just jumping on board and saying, hey, let's do this. When we don't know whether it's constitutional, we're taking away, you know, if, if things go how they went in Israel with 74% of the hospitalizations being fully vaccinated, uh, when you look at it, it basically, the status shows that basically it didn't protect anyone. Um, you know, we're going down a fine line that we might have to totally revise our entire policy in four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. So those are things that I think that we need to take into consideration. Do I agree we should have a policy? Yes, but I think we're missing out on a lot of factors here. And I think that it's uh, it's dangerous to jump to a conclusion. Uh, I get trying to protect people, but we need to protect everyone. Councillor Cadwell. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Jordan. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I support this uh, policy of vaccination. Uh, I'm double vaccinated. I was able to attend the Ticat football game yesterday. Just under 15,000 people were there and everybody was double vaccinated. And they, the way they were checking, uh, it's quite impressive how they handled the, uh, the whole situation there. Uh, again, the science, uh, everybody can debate science and that, and I have my own, uh, my own feelings to it. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I think it's the right thing to do. I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of stuff because we can, we can debate this for, Long, long time. So anyways, I'll support this uh, resolution from the region and uh, look forward to staff uh, coming up with uh, our own uh, Made in Grimsby. Thank you. Councillor Frank. Yeah, Council, thank you, Mayor Jordan. <clears throat> Councillor Cadwell is certainly 100% correct. I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't, won't allow people into town hall. They just have to be tested. They don't want to take, if they don't want to have the double vaccination, that's fine. It doesn't mean that we're going to prevent them from coming to town hall. And I mean, I know there's a lot of experts on council about this. I mean, and uh, certainly uh, one or two of you think, seem to know all the answers, but I don't think you don't have all the answers. We do know that the vaccinations do something and that's better than nothing as Councillor Ritchie has said a minute ago. So let's let's put this policy in place. It's, it's, it's the best we know. It's, it's, the, it's the only thing we know right now that does work. And, and we know with the numbers that are going up in Ontario that 70% or more of those who are hospitalized are those who don't have double vaccinations. I mean, that's statistics. If you want to look at that, that must mean something. Uh, so yes, we, we, should, we should take the step forward and do this uh, on behalf of everyone who, who is in town and comes to our events, comes to town hall. And you know, we're, we're not just protecting ourselves, we're protecting others as well. So let's not forget that. So, and let's not all pretend that we're, we're experts at this because we're not. We, we just, we know that over the last number of years, last over past year, especially in the past few months that vaccinations do help. So I, I welcome the other experts to say something. Councillor Vane. Um, <clears throat> two points here. Uh, first of all, I think that there's such a, a vast amount of information out there. It's everybody's got an opinion. Um, and uh, I think based on that comment, I, I'm a little concerned that we're using um, comments to attack each other over opinions. And, you know, I think that's why we were elected is to represent the opinions of our, of our constituents and attacking each other is not going to get us anywhere. So I, I don't necessarily agree with, um, with some of the councillors comments uh, that have been made by some of the councillors. But I will be supporting this because I the re same reason I got the vaccination is the same reason I'll support this is because people like myself uh, who may have a slightly compromised immune system and I know other counselors do as well um, that that's why I do it and I think Councilor Frake said it best when he said that we're doing it for others so all I'm going to ask though is that we just respect each other's opinion that's all but yeah I will be supporting it thank you Councilor Ritchie. Thank you through the mayor. And that's a great point. So with the D variant vaccinated or unvaccinated individuals can get COVID. And the problem, the most of the people that are actually can get hospitalized by that are whether you're vaccinated or not, are individuals who have cor comorbidities. So this is where I'm saying that I, I'm okay with the policy, but I think everyone going into town should be doing a rapid test. 
because it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not, you can still carry and transmit COVID. And if you have people who don't have to disclose the core mobilities working in the office and something and, and something happens, we have to, this, this policy is to protect everyone. So we need to look at those stats. And that's where I sit there and say, Israel is, is three, four months ahead of us. They're the ones that have determined, and they only use the Pfizer shot in Israel. And they're the ones that determined and came up with the information that after about five to six months, the efficacy rating of the Pfizer shot diminishes. That's why they're looking at booster shots. So again, I don't have a problem with the policy, but I do think we need to, if we're going to protect people, what's wrong with a rapid antigen test for everyone going into town hall? It's very quick and that should protect all people. That's what, I'm, that's what I think we should be looking at. I think we need to expand it and do a better job to protect all individuals. Because like I said, whether you're vaccinated or not, you can still get and transmit COVID and the most at risk are those individuals who have comorbidities, which is two or more underlying issues. Councillor Sharp. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Jordan. Um, would we be agreeable to adding that to the resolution that uh, all persons should be tested with rapid antigen testing? Because it does leave us open to people who are, are vaccinated that could be um, carrying COVID and, and transmitting it. And then so if only the, or if the unvaccinated people are tested, then they would be safer than the vaccinated people because if you're testing yourself, when you come, if you have COVID-19, you won't attend town hall. But um, people who are vaccinated who might have COVID-19, uh, but to a much lesser degree apparently, or um, they might not even know that they have it and they could be transmitting it to other people who are there who have been tested because there might be people who are there that have been tested. And then a person who has been vaccinated but has COVID-19, but has uh, fairly mild symptoms and, and just thinks, so oh, maybe it's just sore throat or like allergies or something that could come to town hall and could transmit it to a person, a resident, that is um, not vaccinated and who has complied with the policy. And so there'd be residents there, um, there could be residents there who um, expect to be protected that might not be as protected as they think by the um, people who are not tested. So can we include in this um, across the board rapid antigen testing that everyone should be tested and that way we, we would be safer. Uh, I'm not prepared to do and that. I'd like to uh, second that if he puts that in. Yeah, I, I would. I would like to make that amendment. Can you ask the original mover of this motion if they would be? Yeah, okay. who's the mover? Before you, guys jump off, before you guys jump off the diving board there? Yeah, I'm. Can, I'm Councilor would you Frank okay is, as the mover. Um, is so, that a friendly amendment? I will accept that friendly amendment because it will give us extra it'll give us an extra level of, of testing. I have no problem with that. If it's okay with my okay. second, uh, if it's okay with my second or Councillor uh, Bothwell. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's good. That's an extra layer. And it also kind of removes some I, of I, the- I, um, The I'm CAO, CAO yeah. would like to yeah, speak. And Rich, so, uh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, Councillor Frank, I'm not willing to, uh, to add that to the motion, sorry. I don't know if we have the staff or the capacity to yeah. even do it. Uh, CAO, do you have a comment on that? Yes, uh, you know, I, I'm concerned about that. We don't have the capacity. The province has has not promoted that. And that's what they're using for the high risk areas at first. That's effective September 7th. So, so now we're not high that, risk. you're going beyond the province. I'm, I'm happy and, to, and I'm happy to, sorry to interrupt know. CAO, but I'm happy to leave this resolution as it is. Um, and vote on it this way and uh and we'll see if uh down the road things change we can okay. also um, always readdress it and plus so I, I was I'd like to i'd like to work yeah. with the region on this uh mayor yeah you know, because yeah i agree got the mayor, staff jordan, mayor jordan got, please i was i was making an amendment team. i was making an amendment to this and then um councillor freak um, graciously offered to make the amendment friendly, I but it was already seconded by Councillor Ritchie. I did not it. I did not. No, it, was it was seconded by so, Councillor Bothwell. Um, I know, Mayor Jordan. It, so 
since He's since not it's not a friendly amendment, friendly amendment, can I please make it a, an, an official amendment? And will Councillor Ritchie? Yeah, the clerk will second. draw it up. I'm only willing to amend it if my seconder is, is going to go along with it. Okay. And, and I'm not. So we're back to the original one. Well, there's a motion on the floor to, um, to um, amend the resolution. So we have to vote on that first. The amendment is that, that all persons should be tested with the rapid antigen testing. Moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Ritchie, resolved that the resolution regarding COVID-19 vaccination policy be amended to include that all persons be required to have rapid antigen testing. CAO? Yes, Mayor, can I speak to this? Uh, yes. It, so the province for September 7th has promoted the fact that individuals who do not provide full vaccination against COVID-19 will be required to undertake regular antigen testing. That is what the region is sort of following with, with all their high risk right now on September 7th. And that's what we'll all be working towards. To really, um, I strongly recommend that council, this would be very difficult for us to implement across all our employees. And, you know, working with the region, we are looking at all the legal and human rights matters. And, and I do feel this takes us into a territory that we're just not familiar with at this point. So, you know, perhaps that might evolve to that as the province and the region moves towards that, but I would strongly recommend that we wouldn't be able to handle the capacity of that as a town of Grimsby. Councillor Ritchie. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I know that, that the, how the testing is going at the uh, at Niagara Health, for anybody who is not vaccinated, it is they're given a box of rapid tests. They are to take a test once a week and it's an honor system. So when you look at these honor systems, but they have to be prepared to show proof if needed at any point in time. So once a week. So I don't see a huge burden when it comes to staff time. I don't see uh, a burden to, um, to implement an extra a level of safety, especially when you look at the potential of the harm it may cause to individuals who have comorbidities. And under the MPI FFA, I believe it is, the provincial uh, standards when it comes to health, that are not health, but uh, an individual's privacy rights for uh, health, I think that this is a, a great way to move forward to, because those individuals that do have comorbidities shouldn't have to uh, state what they are or be afraid to come to work. And my understanding across the province that these policies are in place to protect uh, those individuals against the unvaccinated. And I sit there and say that I think everyone needs to be protected in this time frame. And that's where I think that's why I think this should be supported and we move forward. And at this time, like I said, and I think that it's a small cost to 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 pay right now. I had a great conversation today with a pharmacist about this, and I think that it's a, a great way to move forward where nobody is being discriminated against. Thank you. Councillor Bothwell. Just a quick question. Do we know what the cost is to the individual um, or the town to do weekly testing, rapid testing, um, and times how many employees and whatever, and would the town how would the town be responsible for paying that? Yeah. I would think that we haven't been able to cost that. And if we're forcing that into a policy, we would have to allow the employees the time to do that. And there would be lost productivity time of that as well. So 
we haven't been able to cost that. No one's talked about it across the municipalities and we would need time to assess that to really provide you an informed decision. If you like, uh, I know a box of 25 rapid tests is about $250. Um, most, a lot of places right now are getting the rapid test for free. It's provided through the province. I'm not saying that we would, but I do know that uh, a box of 25 rapid tests is about $250. Councillor Sharp. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Um, I would like to make a motion to refer this to staff for information. Uh, we're going to vote on this um, uh, resolution right now. Uh, moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Ritchie. Point, Resolve point of order, that Mr. Mayor. A referral motion takes precedence. All right, so we'd need to vote to refer. Thank you, Councillor Ritchie. Point of clarification. So are we doing two separate motions, Mayor? Um, the first one is to receive and the second one is to refer. And then if the referral is not not approved, then we move to the original motion. Well, I, th I think that we're referring this. Um, are, are we referring the whole motion or referring the amendment? Oh, okay, if, it's, if we're referring the whole motion. And we're not moving forward, really. So, moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Ritchie, resolved that the item on COVID-19 vaccination policy update be referred back to staff. Our recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Frake? No. Councillor Cowell? No. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Councillor Sharp? Yes. That was a yes. Councillor Vane? Uh, yes. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? To refer it back to staff? No. No? That's a tie that's defeated. Can you hear me now? I don't know if maybe my microphone is not working. No, you, you, I think you were backwards on the muting, unmuting, that's all. Okay. All right, so now we, yeah. now we move to the amendment. Moved by Councillor Sharp, okay. second by Councillor Ritchie, resolved that resolution regarding COVID-19 vaccination policy be amended to include that all, all persons, persons requiring to have rapid, rapid antigen, antigen, antigen testing. testing. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Frake? No. Councillor Cowell? No. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? No. That's 4 4. That's defeated. All right, now we move to the uh, original motion. Moved by Councillor Frake, second by Councillor Bothwell. Resolved that the correspondence under administration and finance pertaining to Niagara Region Memorandum CAO 17 2021 COVID 19 vaccination policy update be received and that staff, in consultation with the Region Municipality of Niagara, be directed to develop and implement a policy and 
any required procedures to require all town employees to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 at the earliest opportunity subject to and in compliance with any applicable legal directives and requirements, including but not limited to applicable human rights obligations, accommodation of employees legally entitled to, titled to accommodation, MFIPPA and PHIP, and that the applicable provisions of the aforementioned vaccination policy include members of council who wish to attend in-person meetings, including committee and council, conduct business on town property or facilities, or attend official events in their capacity as a town councillor. Recorded vote. Mr. Mayor, we can have discussion on that? Yes, Councillor Ritchie. Thank you. To you, Mr. Mayor, um, without the added uh, precautions taken, to protect all individuals with potential, with if they have comorbidities or not, I uh, I'm not prepared to support this at this time. I just wanted to make that very clear that uh, if if we look and took the extra steps and protected more people and treated our and 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 we did it for the safety of everyone, I'd be absolutely okay with that. But at this time, I'm not just uh, I'm not prepared to to do this um, without without taking the extra steps. So I just wanted to make that my point clear. Councillor Sharp. Yeah, Mayor Jordan, I think this is a mistake. I think that um, the vaccines have not been tested for a very long period of time and that we, um, we're we not fully sure. I mean, no one can say they're an expert here. Even the experts aren't experts. They're, um, they, they're unsure of whether these vaccines work or not. Um, and so we're making a policy, right, without protecting everyone. Like, there are people who will be attending town hall who don't know if they have COVID or not. And there will be people attending town hall who will have to be tested to know if they have COVID. And um, that'll include town staff, inside and outside workers. And um, I just think this, this is not the right move to make. And uh, I won't be supporting it. All right, seeing no further questions, uh, I read the resolution and uh, I'll call for a recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Frake? Yes. Councillor Catwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? No. Councillor Sharp? No. Councillor Bain? I'm going to err on the side of caution and say no. Councillor Vardy? Councillor Vardy? No. No? Council Mayor, Mayor Jordan? Jordan? Yes. That's defeated. All right. Moving to the rest of the correspondence. Oh, there's one more. All right. Um, we have a request for the United Way flag raising. Um, need a mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Ritchie. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Ritchie. Resolved that the correspondence under administration and finance pertaining to the United Way flag raising request be received and the council approve the request. All in favor? That's carried. All right. Councilor Bothwell. Uh, can I please lift uh, CL Casey, the 2021-138 bylaw, 2021-66 bylaw, 2021-67, please? All right. Um, so do you want to lift that and discuss it now? And then, all right. So we'll lift that one and discuss it now. So, um, as the clerk's preparing that one, um, go ahead, Councillor Bothwell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Jordan. I was just pleased to see, and I think if I'm understanding this correctly, and perhaps our public works director can help me understand, uh, the two bylaws that are attached here that were late additions to the agenda, one of them is to reduce the speed limit, I believe, from 60 kilometers per hour on Casablanca between 
the QE and uh, Highway 8 uh, Main Street West, um, reducing it from 60 to 50 because it's removing and deleting the uh, the current speed limit of 60. So I just want to clarify if that's the case. And the second one is just um, an extension on a parking restriction on Main Street uh, West. Oh, I'm sorry, Main, uh, Main Street West between uh, Patton Street and uh, Christie Mountain Street on the south side only. But I was just, uh, I just am mainly looking at the clarification on the um, on the speed limit reduction, if that if that's correct, and and whether we're going to see some additional enforcement when the when the signage, or I guess there'll be no signage, so it'll be a matter of um, uh, the standard fifty kilometer an hour in town, and 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 we'll be we we'll be looking at some additional enforcement when this comes into place. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, CIO. Our, our director of public works could not attend tonight, but we'll get to that clarification. Councillor Bothwell, I'll meet with him tomorrow morning. Uh, that's great. And Councillor Furtick, is he? He's not on our call today either, right? Um, no, I don't. I don't see him today. Okay, so yeah, I would just appreciate that. Um, uh, I think that that's good news because people in there have been complaining about it being a, a raceway. So uh, I'm happy to see that. Thank you. You have the resolution. All right. So I have Councillor Bothwell as the mover for lifting that one. Just need a seconder. Councillor Cadwell. Moved by Councillor Bothwell, second by Councillor Cadwell. Resolved that the correspondence on Niagara Region CLK C 2021-138 bylaw 2021-66 bylaw 2021-67 be received. All in favor? That's carried. All right, now we have the rest of the correspondence. Need a mover and seconder. Move by Councillor Sharp, seconder. Councillor Bothwell. Moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Bothwell. Resolved that the following correspondent items be received. Notification Premier Ford Comprehensive machine, machine, or Marine Strategy. Niagara Region Report CLK C 2021 PDS 32-2021. Update on Niagara Official Plan. Further draft policy development. Niagara Region will Report C LK C 2021-144 PDS. 34-2021 Regional Response Proposed Land Use Compatibility Guideline and Niagara Region Report PDS 33-2021 Niagara Official Plan Land Needs Assessment and Settlement Area Boundary Review Update be received and Niagara Regional On Demand Dashboard West Niagara be received. All in favor? That's carried. All right, our next meeting of the Committee of the Whole is scheduled for September 27th, 2021 at 6 p.m. And before we adjourn, uh, we will be back for our council meeting at, at uh, 7.55. See you.
Recording in progress. Good evening. I'd like to call uh, Town of Grinsby Council uh, for Tuesday, September 7th, 2021 to order. Uh, we'll start with playing of the national anthem. So could everyone rise, please? All right, moving to uh, number three. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, move to four, approval of the agenda. The mover and seconder, moved by Councillor Cadwell. Seconder, Councillor Vane. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Vane, resolved that the agenda for the Committee of the Whole meeting of September 7th, 2021 be approved. All in favor? That's carried. Move to adoption of the previous minutes. I need a mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Frake, second by Councillor Vane. Moved by Councillor Frake, second by Councillor Vane, resolved that the Committee of the Whole minutes of August 23rd, 2021, Council minutes of August 23rd, 2021, and the Special Council minutes of August 30th, 2021 be approved. All in favor? That's carried.
Oh, Councillor Dunsell, do you have your hand up? No, I, 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 sorry, I was trying to vote. I guess okay. That's the only way right. I knew how to vote. All sorry right. about that, but that's okay. Yeah. yeah now we're keep moving my hand to going up on your voting. Then, yeah. Thank you. Now we're moving to uh, number eight on the agenda reports uh, report CAO 2114 shared fire service pilot project. CAO. Through you, Mayor, and to all of Council. Um, if you recall, on June 21st, um, this Council supported moving forward on a pilot project with Lincoln on a shared fire service. There was a couple things that we needed to finalize was that was a legal review, the MOU, which they've done, and there's been uh, very minor changes to it. In that June 21st report, we provided a number of uh, details about what the MOU entailed. And then um, Lincoln Council supported this and we supported it. And now we're coming forward with some housekeeping on a number of the bylaws that are going forward in front of you. Um, we also have to, in, in one of the uh, sessions, develop a, the, um, the advisory committee and select the advisory committee. So this report is just to comprehensively look at all the actions and the bylaws to move forward with this. And then of course, um, work with the mayor and council on selecting the advisory committee, which in the terms of reference had referenced one mayor and, and two, two of the councillors and the CAO is a voting member of both municipalities. So thank you, mayor, and thank you council for supporting this. And, and now we're going to the final steps of making this happen for October 1st. Thank you, CAO. And I have uh, Greg Hudson here. I think Greg's um, the fire chief, as well as Bill Thompson here for any questions. Good evening, Greg and, and Bill. <laughs> Councillor Sharp. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, so we have a couple of, uh, I guess, bylaws or resolutions to approve within this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to make an amendment to uh, bylaw 21 68, the Shared Fire Services Committee. And that's uh, with regard to um, the composition of the committee. There's um, eight voting members. Two of those are the CAOs of both municipalities. And um, I would like to um, remove those two from the uh, voting members and move them to the non-voting members. So if I could make a resolution to uh, to amend the bylaw 2168. I'll second that. I'm getting dead air here. Is there um <laughs> all right? I'll read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Frank, resolved that item the item on shared fire service pilot project be amended to change the terms of reference to move the CAOs from voting members to non-voting members in bylaw 21 68. Uh discussion, Councillor Ritchie, you're first up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um I think it's a great idea. It's a governance uh committee. Um, and I'd like to make a further amendment on the amendment because it is an intergovernmental relationship or committee. And I'd like to make an amendment to that uh, uh, 
fee point for the committee membership where it'll read 8.4.1. The joint advisory committee shall total 11 members and should be compromised of six voting members, three elected members of the municipal council of each municipality and five non-voting members, which would be the CEOs of both municipalities and the fire clerk and the two deputy clerks. I'm not looking for a friendly amendment there. I'm just looking for a seconder on that amendment. So it, it would include Sharp's, uh, Councillor Sharp's uh, motion and it would change it to three uh, members of council, which could still include the mayor. It just opens it up to the democratic process to vote everyone in. I'll second that. Uh, sorry, I, I, could you just repeat that, please, through you, Mr. Mayor? Uh, Councillor Ritchie, could you just repeat your proposition so I understand it? Sure. Is that all right, Mr. Mayor, if I repeat it? Sure. So it says here, so if you're looking at the B.4 committee membership, uh, I want to, I want to, you know, the proposed amendment was, will be the joint advisory committee shall total 11 members and shall be compro compromised or comprised of a six voting members, which will be three elected members of the municipal council of each municipality and B five non-voting members, the CEO of both municipalities, the fire chief and two deputy fire chiefs. So if I may th through you, Mr. Mayor, um, this is a pilot or this is a proposed pilot, which we've given approval in principle, but we haven't uh, really voted on the details as yet. But just for my clarity, and no offense to you, Mr. Chief Hudson, but um, I believe uh, Acting Chief Thompson is still Acting Chief Thompson. Is he not? Like, this, this assumes throughout the pilot that he's no longer Acting Chief for Grimsby. Okay. And I didn't think that we had decided that already. I mean, I, I, I know everybody's going to work together, but it, this does make an, an assumption. And um, I wonder if that could be clarified for me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in the June 21st report that we approved and council approved to move forward with the shared service effective in October principle. when, no, it wasn't in principle. It was that we approved it to move forward. There was a, a, an appendix in there that showed the new structure as of October 1st, where the um, fire chief would be Greg Hudson and the, the two deputies would have roles within reporting to Chief Hudson. And even in some of my presentations prior to that, it was always when we moved towards this pilot of shared services, we have to give the one fire chief the accountability to make this work. And then the um, deputy chief, Bill Thompson and Bill Blake will move a report to Greg Hudson. So that was always in the um, org charts and, and discussions that we've had to date. So then the fire chief come October would report to both CAOs? Yes, and that's that was all in the document as well. They report to both CAOs. Right. Thank you. Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, I, I did not support the pilot in June when the original report came forward and I heard basically the same concerns that I'm bringing forward again today. The report in June stated that the purpose of uh, the working group to look at the shared services model was to determine if the adoption of a shared fire service would result in a more efficient, effective and affordable model. And um, that report actually states as well, uh, further along on page seven, that um, the anticipated annual operation cost for Grimsby would realize a slight savings in 2021, and we anticipate annual operational costs being cost neutral 2022. Um, the shared service model is intended to improve operational efficiencies, but there was there was there's no uh, potential for that to happen within the, the pilot uh, period. The the shared service model also uh, was going to uh, implement a, uh, in an effort to promote equity and teamwork, 
Grimsby's deputy chief, prevention officers, and training officers' salaries will be harmonized with Lincoln's salary grid. Lincoln's salary grid is higher than ours. So during this pilot, six, at least six members of Grimsby's firefighting staff will receive pay increases and possibly benefit increases to harmonize with Lincoln. That's not in the budget. Um, I have a concern that we're also undertaking a comp uh, compensation review right now, which might end up uh, looking at those positions and identifying whether there's a need for further salary increases or, or harmonization. So I think it's premature. Um, when, and once you commit in a pilot to giving people more money, that's forever. You can't say after two years that oh, we're going to go back to the way things were. So um, I have a concern about that. I have a concern that, uh, well, it does say realistically significant cost savings are not anticipated as a result of the pilot. Rather, any, any savings would be likely minimal and achieved through cost sharing basically in the long term, future anticipated costs. To me, it's a cart before the horse. The report also talked about doing the fire master plan. The fire master plan would be jointly developed during the pilot project to assist both councils to determine appropriate strategic goals and objectives and service level policies, and would provide recommendations regarding the future provisions of services, whether individually or as a continuation of a shared service model. To me, the fire master plan, which is paid for, I believe, through development charges, should be the first thing that we do. Um, and then the second is it talks about a financial audit cost benefit analysis what are our savings you know if we're not going to see them in the first two years and then we move to the full implementation in, in the next two years what are those cost savings what is the expense to the taxpayer we haven't seen any numbers we haven't seen anything um and we're, we're hearing already that it's it's we'll be lucky if we come out of the first two years with no additional cost but more than likely we will see a cost um, to the taxpayer. So to me, um, what I would like to see happen is that we do that fire master plan, determine the feasibility of this type of a pilot and this type of a shared service model, do that research, get your ducks in a row, and then say, hey, yeah, let's do a pilot. Um, so I'd like to see if there's a way to do an amendment to the recommendations that are being presented tonight that council um, uh, recommend that the fire master plan and a third party audit to determine the feasibility of a shared services model be undertaken prior to any pilot. So I would like to see that as um, a motion, whether uh, whether it comes forward as an amendment um, to the existing recommendation number two that's in our report tonight. I'm very not I'm just not comfortable with moving forward with this with uh, hearing that, uh, you know, we haven't looked at what Grimsby is going to get, how is it going to improve the services for us? And especially in the West End where we're already suffering and we're having a rural response rather than an urban response. Um, I think the fire master plan will determine, you know, where those needs are and um, whether or not this type of a, a shared service model will actually be of a benefit to us. So, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm concerned with the the salary increases being implemented during the first two years of the pilot and, and that's a done deal. Um, Capital property is another. Um, just, just too many unknowns. We're, we're going into this without having any prep work, any cost benefit analysis done prior. And it's talking about doing it during the pilot. You don't, you know, during the pilot, you do it and then midstream you say, oh, hey, this is costing us more than we expected. I don't think our taxpayers deserve that. I think they know, need to know up front what does this mean for us? What is the 5, 10, 15 year vision? And I think the audit and the fire master plan can determine the feasibility of that prior to us entering into the pilot. So I'd like to put that amendment forward. Thank you. Mayor. So for unclear, oh, go ahead, Mayor. CAO. Yeah, just for clarification, there was just a couple things in there. I wanna be sure the rest of the council and the public is aware of. We have studied the salary adjustments. They are included in the budget because we're not hiring a fire chief. They are temporary adjustments. They're not adjustments that would go on forever if the pilot was unsuccessful, but we have factored that all in um, and, and therefore, we're still seeing a slight savings in 2021 and neutrality in 2022. So they are factored. The, the main thing here is that, you know, and we've been working on this for a long time now with updates to council, that we will be providing a better level of service across both municipalities by doing this. But I just wanted that clarification. That is very clear that we've factored those costs in and they're not permanent costs. 
Thank you. Um, thank, well, CAO, I appreciate your response, Mayor, if I may respond. Um, it doesn't say anywhere that they're temporary increases. And I don't know about you, but if you give somebody a raise, um, like, and you say, oh, hey, it's only for two years. Um, and I, I just I just don't think that's fair then to say, hey, how does council say then we're taking it back? So I, I think it's, that's a really awkward situation. And the other thing is that for termination for convenience on the pilot, we have 90 days to opt out if we're not seeing the benefits, but we will see the benefits. And there is such thing as temporary adjustments for increased workload. We do it all the time across other areas. So um, that is a factor that we've already considered. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell, just for clarification. So does that mean you want to defer the pilot at, um, until such time as the the uh, joint master fi or fire master plan and the joint con cost benefit analysis is done. Is that what you're getting yes. at? Yes, please. Thank you, Mayor. That would be the wording. All right. Mayor, okay. just the point of uh, clarity, we have a motion on the floor. Do we not? Seconded from Councillor Sharp. So the deferral motion takes precedent. Yeah, yeah. So, so the deferral, Councillor Bothwell's deferral motion would take precedence. Is there a seconder there? I second it. Councillor Frakes, a seconder. Can I speak to it as well? Deferrals are debatable. Deferrals aren't debatable. Council, uh, Mayor, can I add one more thing? Yes, CEO. You know, if we approve this, we'll actually do, we'll see a cost increase in our operations. We've been working without a deputy for some time. We realized that the compensation review will require us to pay the deputy and fire chiefs more than they're making today. So we'll actually see an impact, a negative impact, an increase in operating costs in 2022 because this fire service review will take us one year. I really wanna recommend to council that we uh, move forward with this. We'll actually see negative consequences on our cost lines by not moving forward with the pilot. I just felt I had to disclose that. Just in case right. this is accepted. All right, so we have the, thank you. Uh, we have the resolution on the floor, moved by Councillor Bothwell, second by Councillor Frank. Resolved that the item on shared fire service pilot project be deferred until a fire master plan and third party audit be done to review the feasibility of a pilot fire, fire shared services. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Dunstall? No. Councillor Frake? Yes. Councillor Catwell? No. Councillor Ritchie? No. Councillor Sharp? No. Councillor Vane? No. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's defeated. Yeah. Now we move to the motion to amend, moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Frank. Resolved that the item Point on- 30, Mr. Mayor. Yes. I made an amendment on the amendment. And it was seconded by Councillor Sharp. All right. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Sharp. Resolved that the item on shared fire service pilot project be amended to change the terms of reference to alter membership from mayor and two councillors to three members of council in bylaw 2168. Recorded vote or discussion, Clarity, Mr. Mayor. Frake. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yes. It's not, uh, there's more to it. It includes, it's an amendment on the amendment. So it actually includes Councillor Sharp's amended, amended uh, his amendment as well. So it should be that uh, the joint advisory committee shall total 11 members and shall be 
comprised of a six voting members, three elected members of the municipal council of each municipality and B five non-voting members, the C which uh, comprised of the CAO of both municipalities, the fire chief and two deputy fire chiefs. So it includes Councillor Sharp's amendment as well. Uh, and, and just a point of clarification, it is very difficult to do these amendments on amendments on the fly. So uh, yeah, I totally understand if, if this was planned in advance, it, it would have been nice to have uh, something written in advance for the clerk. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I had planned on doing the one I didn't plan on sharp. So I changed that up and I sent it to the clerk. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Sharp. Resolved that the item on shared fire service pilot project be amended to change the terms of reference to alter membership from one mayor and two councillors to three members of council and to move the CAOs from voting members to non voting members in bylaw 2168. Recorded vote. Can um, actually. Uh, Mr. Mayor, are we not I having think, any discussion? Oh, sorry. Yes, discussion. Um, and probably these should be voted on separately. It's like an A and B. Uh, Councillor Frank. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. I was gonna suggest that we do that in two parts, but if that's okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not in support of moving ahead with this particular pilot simply because, you know, we still don't know what the real cost efficiencies are. I, I hear the CEO said you have negative cost factors next year possibly did i hear you say that harry or did, correct me if i'm wrong if we don't move forward with the pilot there'll yeah. be cost increases in the operating costs of the baseline so without moving forward with lincoln on a shared service model we will see major increases on fire services operating costs can you explain what those are through you mayor the cost would be that our prevention officers, as well as deputy and, and fire chief, have been paid at a different level and we're going through the compensation review. We've been going without a deputy fire chief for the entire year, year and a half now with Chief Thompson. And we would have to add those costs and recruit those costs at a much higher salary. So we would see increased costs for 2022, absolutely, if we do not move forward. Okay, so uh, having said that, <clears throat> if at the end of this pilot program, we decide not to continue with joint services, uh, what type of costs will we have incurred that we can't roll back? If there's an opt out, we, uh, we would go if we back. To out, if we don't opt out in 90 days and we continue with this pilot, at the end of the, at the, end of the pilot, can we roll back any costs we've incurred? The only thing, if the pilot is not successful, is what you're saying? That's correct. We would, we would look at those, those temporary adjustments and maybe adjust them slightly downward or, you know, adjust them a bit. Uh, salaries, for example, would, could you, would you be able to legally roll back salaries? Again, we, as I described earlier, these will be temporary adjustments through the pilot program based on the increased workload of a deputy now running a, a municipality of 56,000, you know, if you add Lincoln and, and uh, Grimsby. So there's more responsibilities with that. So that's a temporary adjustment that we could roll back to some extent. I, I would like to have seen that analysis before tonight. And uh, so that's why I endorsed uh, Councillor Bothwell's, you know, um, motion to defer for more information because I think there's there's some missing pieces in the in the analysis as it relates to costs and efficiencies. Uh, I don't think we, we did do a wholesome study and uh, therefore you know I'd like to see uh, that first and and maybe I would I'd like to defer it for that reason and I'd like to that's why I endorsed Councillor Bothwell's uh, motion. So um, I'll leave it at that. I guess everyone else wants to have a word. So that's that's my thoughts on it. And uh, but, and thank you for your answers, uh, CEO. Councillor Cadwell. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. Just clarification. I look to uh, uh, Interim Chief Bill Thompson. Uh, Councillor Bothwell 
referenced rural response to the West End. Um, you know, been away from this a little bit, but my understanding, rural response is where there's no hydrants. But so the West End has hydrants all around the West End, right, Chief? Um, through you, Mayor, that's correct, Councillor, but it's just not about no hydrants. Uh, some areas of town still can be rural with a hydrant. Um, it's based on, we look at the Planning Act and where our zones are planned. That's what we'll look at. Um, so you have parts of the West End that are urbanized um, towards the Hunter Road area. And then when you move out more westerly, of course, you're going to have some rural areas. But I'd like to make it very clear, our semi-annual report in June clarified our response times and that we're meeting the NFPA standard at this time, the fire service. So we are doing very well on our rural, urban and suburban responses at this time for structure fires. Thanks, Chief. Councillor Barge. Sorry, I think that's not why my hand was up, sorry. All right, seeing no further discussion. Um, I, I did have something I wanted to say, sorry. Um, I, I don't like it. Um, I think both mayors uh, should be on this committee. So I don't support the amendment that it's um, just three councillors. I think mayors of both towns need to be there. So um, for that reason, I can't, I can't support that part of the amendment. And uh, I, I'd also like to know uh, what the, um, our fire experts, uh, Mr. H Chief Hudson and Acting Chief Thompson, uh, think about what they need on that kind of committee, what sort of skill sets um, would best uh, support the kind of work that they need to undertake. I, I'd like to hear from both of them. Chief Hudson, I will have you go first and then uh, Bill. All right, thanks, uh, Mayor Jordan, through you to uh, Councillor Vardy. You know, it, uh, at the end of the day, this remains a uh, committee of council, uh, similar to many other types of uh, committees of council. Um, you know, we're looking to you for policy decision, some of the higher level decision making processes where we would be looking at budgets and, and things at a, a higher level um, as kind of a first step in the approval process, knowing that, you know, it goes to the, the joint committee first, and then it would have to go to each respective uh, municipal council for final approval. Um, you know, there are other models, I think we've mentioned in previous reports, there are other models in Ontario similar to this that have worked uh, very well for 20 plus years. And that's kind of the model we structured this at. Uh, in terms of expertise, uh, I don't envision, uh, you know, let me back up a step. I, I don't envision this being more of an operational role. In fact, I think as I mentioned, this should be more of a strategic, more of a, a higher level uh, policy role versus getting into the nuts and bolts of everyday uh, uh, matters of the fire department, which would really be staff's uh, perspective. So, um, you know, we're just looking for good leadership and, you know, to, to look at the best interests of council as a whole for each respective municipality. So, so I would infer, infer from that more of a business background is required at this stage. Uh, Perhaps business or, you know, just uh, generally, I think, you know, you're all elected as elected officials through various backgrounds. And, you know, I think by extension of that, I, I can kind of see a similar role. So, yeah. Thank you. Chief Thompson. Well, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vardy. I uh, concur with Chief Hudson, and uh, I believe these people need to be people that are at strategic level. Um, do not get into the weeds of the fire department. That is our role to come to you and make the, de um, the decisions that we've come with um, through the fire master plan and our expertise in the service, especially a volunteer service. It takes a lot to run a composite department, which includes full-time staff. Um, so all of you, as, as uh, Chief Hudson had said, were elected for a reason. You all bring different skill sets and any of you can sit on this committee 
at any time. And uh, I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Councillor Bain. I just wanted to um, respond to uh, one comment there. Um, the um, if I'm not mistaken, and, and I, I've heard that Lincoln is also putting forward a motion to have three members of council. That doesn't mean the mayor can't be chosen as one of the members. It's just saying, I believe Lincoln's doing that. So we're not doing anything any different than our partner. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Chief Hudson, but I believe that's what I've heard. Uh, if you know any different, but that's what I heard is they were looking at three members of council, period. I see you, Mr. Mayor, if I could just respond to that. Uh, so uh, actually later this evening, uh, um, Lincoln's Council will be meeting to debate this very thing. And as you know, the, uh, the bylaw, the terms of reference was presented to this council, the same uh, terms of reference was also presented in the same format originally uh, to Lincoln's Council. That is a mayor plus two members of council. Uh, I suspect that may be uh, some matter of debate, but I can't say for sure until they actually get into it uh, later on this evening. So that remains to be seen. Thank you. Councillor Bothwell. Sorry, if I can follow, oh, sorry. Councillor Bothwell. Okay, thank you, Mayor. It's just a quick thing on uh, the procedural bylaw amendment. Um, I just wanted the clerk to clarify whether that was required because in B.8.1 of the um, Shared Fire Services Community, whatever joint committee, it says, unless otherwise provided for herein, the procedure bylaw of Lincoln shall apply to the proceedings of the Joint Advisory Committee. So is there any need for us to amend ours because it's, it is saying that Lincoln's procedural bylaw applies? Sarah. you, Mr. Mayor, yes, that is uh, what the terms of reference includes, but as good housekeeping, we did uh, change it to update our procedural bylaw, which would apply to any committees moving forward. If they have specific terms uh, regarding quorum, then it could be uh, changed to go th uh, through the terms of reference rather than the procedural bylaw. I guess I'm just wondering why we're doing that when we don't have to do it. Um, and if it affects all of our committees as a result of this, I just have a bit of a concern with that. Thank you. Councillor Cadwell. Thank you, uh, Mayor Jordan. Uh, enjoyed hearing the comments from the, the, the chiefs. I also feel, this is my own personal opinion, that uh, having experience in the fire service uh, it can uh, bring a lot of a lot of things to the table too. Uh, so that's uh, you know, especially with the volunteer system. You know, it's uh, the volunteer system is very unique in the way it works, in the way it serves its community, and that. So uh, again, uh, I, and I'm speaking for myself, having the experience for that. With that is important. I've uh, also been involved in uh, 15 years of budgeting, municipal budgeting. So, uh, yeah, I, the concern I have now, if people that want to be on this committee, but you didn't vote to support it. So, you know, that's just my, my take on that. So, thank you. I think just a commentary, each and every vote is, is, is really independent if you are um, not going to have preconceived biases. Councillor Vardy? Yeah, I, I believe uh, it was Councillor Bothwell who, who voted against the pilot. Uh, we just voted for some uh, deferral for some changes. So uh, just to sort of clarify some of the remarks that Councillor Cadwell has made, I don't believe that Councillor Bothwell has put her name forward to be on the committee. Um, but one thing I guess that concerns me is sort of the timing of all of this. Um, I would think that our terms of reference should be a shared terms of reference, meaning they're the same for both Lincoln and for us. So um, 
you know, uh, I, I, th I think we need to have some agreement on those, on those terms of reference with respect to membership before we start voting on who's going to be part of that membership. Because I don't, I, I don't think it would be appropriate if Lincoln's, for instance, Lincoln agrees to a mayor and two candidates, and we say some, we say something else. Um, I, I think it should be the same for each. And uh, so I, I, I've got a concern that we're we're kind of at a like at a step with this, because the the terms of reference should be um, absolutely the same for for both towns. Councilor Ritchie. Thank you, Mr. You, Mr. Mayor. When we're looking at terms of reference, we're looking at the committee makeup. Uh, at the end of the day, everyone that's on that committee is entitled to one vote. So just like this council, everyone here at this council is entitled to one vote. Doesn't matter if you're a councilor or a mayor or who you may, what your position is, you're entitled to one vote, just like this committee. And this committee, just if there's a mayor on there or no mayors, or maybe one from one municipality, the other one, I believe this committee would pick its own chair. And just because you're mayor doesn't mean you'll be chair. And so do I think that the, the terms of reference necessarily when it comes to the committee structure has to match? No, I disagree. Just like our council, everyone, anybody on this committee is entitled to one vote. Seeing no further questions, I'll read. Is it, it, yeah, I'll read it again. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Sharp, resolved that the item on shared fire service pilot project be amended to change the terms of reference to alter membership from one mayor and two councillors to three members of council and to move the CAOs from voting members to non-voting members in bylaw 2168. Recorded vote. Are we going to do two votes, two different votes, uh, one with the mayor, one without the mayor? Um, I think if we if we defeat this one, then it moves to uh, it moves to to the uh, original, which is just the CAO. Correct. The original okay. amended. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, Councillor Bothwell. No. Councillor Dunstall. Yes. Councillor Frake. No. Councillor Cowell. Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. That's carried. you mr mayor so we will now be doing the voting to appoint uh three members of council to the advisory uh committee there were in order mr mayor yes i'd like to put a motion on the floor uh on how to vote for committee members i'd like to put a motion that all members of council shall vote for their preferred three candidates once all ballots are received by the clerk the clerk will tally the votes and the three candidates receiving the most votes will be appointed to the committee. And I'll look for someone to second that. I'll second it, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, um, may we first, before we vote on our top three candidates, determine who would actually like to have the job? Yes, I, I, I think that that, um, that, that would probably make the most sense. 
Through you, Mr. Mayor. So we did earlier on Canvas on any interest. There were five, and now I guess the mayor, six uh, members of council that put forward their interest. They are Councillor Barty, Councillor Frake, uh, Councillor Ritchie, Councillor Cadwell, Councillor Sharp, and Mayor Jordan. Um, Just, I'll remove my name. Okay. So the clerk's preparing the motion on how to vote now. At, sorry, Mayor, if I may point of clerk. This is Councillor Bobo. Thank you. If um is it when the when the clerk is describing how we can vote, is can we vote for the same person more than once out of our three top three? No. Do you through you, Mr. Mayor, no, you could vote for yourself, but you would be voting on three different uh, candidates. So does it have to be three different is what I'm saying, or can number one and two preferences be the same person? Why can't we put our top three so our first and our second choice can be the same person? Point of order, Mr. Mayor, this is a little bit silly. I've never heard of anything like this before. That, that's the most bizarre thing I've heard. No, I, I disagree with that. I think I should be Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councillor Barty. Um, can we not all vote for our preferred candidate and do first past the post? That's, that's how we do other committees. That's how we do uh, our elections, uh, our municipal elections. So it seems like the appropriate way there's precedent set for um, how these elections go. Well, I, I think our procedural bylaws silent on how we vote for things. So, so I guess we could, you could defeat this, um, and then put another proposal together. I think that's the way it, it works. So, who was the mover and seconder on this? Councillor Ritchie moved. I seconded it. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Vane. Resolved that committee vote by having each voting member cast three choices of candidates and that the top three candidates with the most votes be elected to the advisory committee. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Councillor Frake? No. Councillor Catwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. That's carried. So we're going to proceed. We're just going to share our screen to just make it easier. Councillor Bothwell? Uh, you got to. You got. Yeah. You have to add me. Yes. So each um, candidate has five minutes to speak. We'll start with Councillor Frake. Thank you. 
if you would like to speak on why you should be elected to the committee. I'm going to withdraw. Okay, Councillor Cabal. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, actually, I um, I really look forward to working on this committee uh, with the uh, the chiefs. I've got uh, 36 years experience in the fire service, uh, 15 as volunteers, and uh, so uh, I've done, as I mentioned earlier, I've done many many budgets. I also was uh, involved strongly with our our Grimsley Master Fire Plan in 2010 when it was approved. So we worked on that uh, for, for a time frame before with a very good consultant, learned a lot from them. So uh, yeah, I, I just feel my experience will be, uh, be, be an asset to this, uh, this committee. Thank you. Mr. Ritchie. Thank you. I too think that my experience speaks uh, would, would provide a lot to this committee, 24 years in the fire service, but not just the years of service, uh, having the ability to understand what, what uh, can affect individuals when they come to work every day, especially in that line of work, but also from a policy perspective. In 1998, the Fire Chiefs Association put together uh, a joint partnership with Ryerson University for the Public Administration and Governance Program, as they were looking for individuals to be able to move up in the ranks, help form policies and so forth. I'm proud to have been a part of that for many time, for many years. Uh, I almost have a degree in that program and continue to strive for it. And I think when we're putting a committee together like this, we need to know a lot about what NFPA stands for, what it means, uh, what they are. Also, not just that, we talk about a fire master plan. There's other uh, options out there as well that I know volunteer uh, municipalities are looking at right now and are participating in such as the CFAI. And I think that might be an initiative that we could look at uh, in this joint partnership that will help improve and make, make the, the service that much better. And I'm not saying that CFAI is the way to go, um, but it does allow for more um, quicker changes to adapt to the environment, such as if something like COVID were to happen, whereas the fire master plan is normally done on a three, five, 10 year basis. So with that, I think that uh, again, the, my experience in education speak, speak, uh, speak to this position. And I think it's great to be part of something that's, that's uh, that could go a long way to help improve the service for both communities. Councillor Sharp. My apologies, my computer, my mouse wasn't working proper. So I stood for this committee and I think I'd be a good member of this committee. Um, I am a former member of the administration and finance committee in Grimsby. And that is the committee that used to govern Grimsby fire before we switched to committee of the whole. Um, I'm also an engineering technologist and I work as an estimator preparing budgets and uh, construction capital costs life cycle costs, etc. I work mostly in schools and uh, commercial construction, but I was the site supervisor for a fire hall construction renovation at the CNE grounds in Toronto. That was in 2012. And um, some of the skills I bring for my financial management and budget preparation, I think would be an asset to the committee. And, um, yeah, so I'd like to be on the committee. Thanks. Mayor Jordan. Thank you. Uh, just uh, a few words. Uh, I really feel like I, I would like to be part of the committee. Uh, as uh, both chiefs said, uh, uh, being a volunteer firefighter or a professional firefighter or even a a uh, union rep um, isn't necessary for uh, uh, being on this committee. Uh, I think uh, my vast experience uh, in uh, running my own business, uh, uh, being on council uh, for now uh, over 11 years, uh, and just the fact that I've, I've uh, 
been on several committees. I do sit, sit on a lot of uh, ad hoc committees as well. And uh, really, I feel that I can add to this committee. I know I can work with uh, members of the fire department. And uh, again, with it being non-operational, um, non uh, I really feel that, that I will be an asset to the committee and uh, uh, I, am, I'll, I will be there uh, and uh, I will do a good job. Thank you. Just share the screen. So Councillor Bothwell, if you wanna cast your votes. Uh, so I'm going to just do one person, and that would be Mayor Jordan, please. Point of order. The motion says you have to vote for three. Does it say how? May or shall or may? Shall. Clerk, do I have, can, I abstain, that, can I abstain on the other two? The motion says resolve that committee vote by having each voting member cast three choices of candidates. Okay, um, that doesn't seem real democratic because if I if I don't want to pick three, I should have that option to not pick three. Like I'd like to abstain on my second two choices. That's a vote. Abstaining is a vote according to Robert's rules, I believe. Point of order. I don't think it, it, you vote for all or I think you vote for none. I think because we have an approval of a motion, we would have to follow the motion that was approved. Okay. Well, an abstention is a vote. So that to me, we're given three votes. So and it's also one and two abstentions. Uh, that's clear in Robert's rules of order. And, you know, we don't use Robert's order. just when it's convenient. Robert's rules to express it. Let me finish without you. Excuse me, the mayor can address my point of order. I said point of order. All right, Councillor Ritchie, Just go ahead. Mr. Mayor, a point Thank of you, order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A, clarif please clarify. Councillor Bar 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 just let me give the comment. I'm going to listen to his comment and then I will rule if it is a proper point of order. Thank you. So, our uh, Robert's rules is spoken to when we do not have um, clarity. And we passed a motion that said all members of council shall vote for the preferred three candidates. And that's it. So therefore, Robert's rules of order does not come into play. And we move forward with voting for three candidates. Uh, uh, so I, I will rule that I, I think an abstention is a vote. And I'll challenge you on that. <clears throat> all right. So where are we going to go with this? So we vote it up whether you're right or not. Whether, whether it rules and whether people have to do it. So I can challenge your decision and we'll right. take that to a vote. Go ahead. Can we vote by email? To be transparent in the process, we will be voting openly. Okay.
Mr. So Mayor, so just a point of clarity. So can I clarify? Oh, sorry, Councilor Lucia wants to clarify. Sorry, just to clarify, we there was a uh, chair's ruling and there was a challenge on the ruling. So we're passing a motion uh, that the mayor's ruling be upheld to allow votes to be abstained. So if you vote in favor of it, we are uh, allowing uh, votes to be abstained. If you defeat it, then we won't. Mm -hmm. All right, we need a mover, which was uh, Councillor Ritchie and a seconder. I'll second it. All right, Councillor. Point of clarity, Mr. Mayor. Uh, when you make a ruling and I've challenged, you have an opportunity to speak to, or I have an opportunity to speak to that why I'm challenging it, and you have an opportunity to speak afterwards, and then we vote whether we uphold your ruling or not. We don't need a, a seconder. Okay. So if I may, I'd like to speak to it. Yeah. So I'd like to remind everyone that the motion was all members of council shall, shall vote for their preferred three candidates. Once the ballots are received by the clerk, the clerk will tally the votes and the three candidates receiving the most votes will be appointed to the committee. We voted on this as a council, it was passed. There is no room to abstain. There's no, it doesn't speak to abstaining. It doesn't say, it says, shall vote for their preferred three candidates. All right, and I, I will say that, um, that the reason I, I ruled this way is uh, um, I really don't have any other preferred candidates. And it's as simple as that. Councilor Balfour? Yes. Councilor Dunstall? So uh, I'm voting no. That means I'm not uphold or I don't agree with the ruling, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. No. Councilor Frank? Yes. Councilor Catwell? Nope. Councilor Ritchie? No. Councilor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? No. Councillor Vardy? Yes. And it's a vote for democracy. And it's a vote uh, in favor of not having this. Point of order. Point of order. Is it yes or no, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, skip the speech. Uh, please, please don't interrupt me, Mr. Ritchie. Right. I don't order, make please. Speeches, okay? If you want to make Councilor, speeches, we're not going to make speeches. Councilor, Councilor Bain, Bain, order. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's, That's carried. A point of order, Mr. Mayor. I was just correcting the speaker who was out of turn. I, I believe yeah, you threw that point of order. It's not, on it's not your job. All right. But listen, it's none of your can business. We, so can we stop the bias, Mr. Mayor, please? Can we just stop, stop the crosstalk, Councilor, Councilor Bain? We stop the bias as well. I would appreciate both. Thank you. I just, I just said, said stop, stop the crosstalk. Talk. I didn't interrupt anyone. Okay, so we'll share the screen again. We'll just restart. Uh, Councillor Bothwell, you can cast up to three. Mayor Jordan only. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Dunstall? Yeah, Councillor Richie, Councillor. Cadwell and Councillor Sharp. Councillor Freig? Mayor Jordan. Just one? Only one. I only okay. have one. For, I don't prefer the other. It says preferred. Okay, Councillor Cadwell? Cadwell, Richie, Sharp. Councillor Ritchie? Cadwell, Ritchie, Sharp. Councillor Sharp? Cadwell, Ritchie, Sharp. Councillor Vane? Cadwell, Ritchie, Sharp. Councillor Vardy? Mayor Jeff Jordan. Just one? Okay, Cal uh, Mayor Jordan? 
um, myself and Councillor Sharp. Just two? Yeah. Okay. So the top three would be Councillor Cowell, Councillor Ritchie, and Councillor Sharp. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to serve our community. Thank you. All right. Thank you for subverting democracy. Mayor Jordan, point of order. Yes, Councillor Barty, you need to uh, retract that. I retract comments. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Bill Thompson would like to say something. Yes, uh, Chief Thompson. Uh, you're muted, Bill. Yes, sorry about that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council. And if you don't mind, Chief Hudson and I would like to attend his council meeting just starting after nine. So thank you again and have a good evening. Great. Thank you, uh, Chief Hudson and Chief Thompson. You guys have a good evening as well. Good night. All right, so where are we now? Five. Oh yes, we need a mover and seconder for the original motion. Councilor Sharp, Councilor Ritchie. Moved by Councilor Sharp, second by Councilor Ritchie. Uh, resolved that Report CAO 2114 Shared Fire Service Pilot Project dated September 7th, 2021 be received and the council approve the attached bylaw 2163, a bylaw to authorize the execution of a shared service agreement with the corporation of the town of Lincoln to undertake a pilot project for the provision of fire protection services. Bylaw 2164, a bylaw to jointly establish and regulate a fire department for the town of Grinsby and the town of Lincoln Bylaw 2165, a bylaw to appoint Gregory Hudson as the fire chief of the jointly established fire department for the town of Grinsby and the town of Lincoln. Bylaws 2166 and 2167, bylaws to appoint William Thompson and William J. Blake as a deputy fire chief for the joint, jointly established fire department for the town of Grinsby and the town of Lincoln. Bylaw 2168, a bylaw to establish a joint advisory committee between the town of Grinsby and the town of Lincoln. And bylaw 2169, a bylaw to amend Bylaw 21 or 2065 being bylaw to govern the proceedings of council, local board, and committee meetings, and that council appoint Councillor Cadwell, Councillor Sharp, and Councillor Ritchie to the Joint Fire Services Advisory Committee. Cody vote. No. Councillor Denstall? Yes. Councillor Freight? Absolutely not. Councillor Catwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Roberty? Absolutely not. Mayor Jordan? No. That's carried. All right, we're moving to. Moving uh, to. Uh, Bylaws 2163 to 2170. I need a mover and seconder. Uh, sorry, Mayor, can we please um, just separate the clean yards bylaw from the rest of them and vote separately on it? All right. Thank you. Clerk's preparing that now. All right. All right, so this is to do the other ones and then the clean yards will be separate. So need a mover and seconder. Councillor Cadwell. Seconder. Councillor Ritchie. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Ritchie. Resolved that leave can introduce bylaws 2163 to 2169 inclusive and the same be read a first time. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. 
Councilor Frank? Totally no. Councilor Cadwell? Yes. Councilor Ritchie? Yes. Councilor Sharp? Yes. Councilor Vane? Yes. Councilor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. That's carried. All right, now second and third reading of uh, 2163 to 2169. Mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, seconded by Councillor Cadwell. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, seconded by Councillor Cadwell. Resolved that leave be give, given to introduce bylaws 2163 to 2169, inclusive read of first time, now be read a second and third time, and finally pass. The mayor and town clerk do sign and seal the same and rule council to the contrary notwithstanding. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Councillor Frank? No. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Councillor Sharp? Seems to have disappeared. Yes. Yes. Councillor Bain? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. That's Carrie. Need a mover and seconder for the clean yards bylaw, uh, number 2170. Councillor Bothwell moved. Seconder, Councillor Frake. Moved by Councillor Bothwell, second by Councillor Frank. Resolved that leave be given to introduce bylaw 2170 inclusive and that same be read a first time. All in favor? Yay. That's carried. Need a mover and seconder for second and third reading of 2170. Moved by Councillor Frank, second by Councillor Sharp. Moved by Councillor Frank, second by Councillor Sharp. Resolved that leave be given to introduce bylaw 2170 inclusive, read a first time. Now, now be read a second and third time and finally passed. All in favor? Yay. Oh, and the mayor and town clerk do sign and seal the same and rule council to the contrary notwithstanding. All in favor? That's hey. carried. Thank you. All right, we move to number 14, announcements. Councillor Cadwell. Thank you, uh, Mayor Jordan. I just wanna speak briefly to uh, the McNally House Golf Tournament that's gonna to be held on the 16th of September. Uh, myself and Councilor Ritchie are participating. I spoke to uh, Jody, who's uh, running the tournament. Uh, 182 golfers, wow. Probably one of the largest tournaments uh, I've seen. It's gonna be at Penn Lakes too. So uh, really looking forward to it. Uh, great cause uh, to support McNally House. Thank you. Councillor Sharp. Thanks, Mayor Jordan. Um, just a reminder that school's in and students have gone back today. So my kids and my neighbor's kids and everybody is outside getting ready for school in the morning, waiting for their bus. And uh, so we want to be careful of the kids. And we also want to remember to be careful of the school buses. Uh, you get a big fine. I know sometimes we're rushing around in the morning and um, just be careful. They're really big and yellow and like flashing lights, you know, <laughs> watch out for them. Um, thanks. Be safe, everyone. Councillor Cadwell. 
Yeah, thanks, Mayor Jordan. Just reaching out to you. Uh, sent you an email today. Uh, Councillor uh, Frake responded. Regards to the uh, recycle and garbage pickup in the DIA boundary areas, uh, about 10 o'clock, I was going through town. It was a gridlock parking lot, <clears throat> excuse me, with the trucks uh, having to stop, uh, move every 50 feet or so to pick up the uh, the recycling and garbage shop. I remember back uh, in the past, they used to do it first thing in the morning, Mayor. Is there anything you can, uh, again, I'm not micromanaging here at all. It's just that it was horrible to try to get through town. So um, as our regional representative, is there any uh, anything we can do to find a solution to uh, to help to, to help resolve some of the major traffic issues while they're doing this? Because they used to do it early in the morning. I remember that. So I'm just going to leave that in your... Yeah, I'll, cer I'll certainly pass your concerns to the Deputy um, um, of Public Works, uh, Councillor Furtick. He's not here tonight, but I will contact him. Uh, and um, yeah, if you, if you really want to get me right away, call me on my cell. So. Yeah, I also CC'd uh, Councillor Furtick too. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mayor, I, uh, Mayor, I did send that to the commissioner, the acting commissioner of public works when I saw Great. both Councillor Freak and Councillor Cadwell. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Sia. Councillor Vardy. Uh, yes, the uh, I just want to mention that um, the mayor, myself, and Councillor Freak um, uh, gave remarks at the Motors and Music event that was held uh, on Saturday. It, it was a big success. The bands were great. The, the cars were, uh, you know, fantastic to look at. And I got to sit in a couple of them. And uh, the uh, uh, part of the proceeds went to GBF, uh, who also uh, gave remarks at the, um, uh, at the event. And I just want to say uh, kudos to uh, Sarah Sweeney and Trevor and, and that team for uh, helping us get ready for this event. It tells us that uh, there's a lot more we could be doing with Southward Park. And uh, I hope there's going to be a lot more events there in future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vardy. I just want to echo the um, success of the Motors and Music Festival. And, and we're certainly looking forward to bigger and better festivals uh, at Southward Park so it can be utilized uh, to its fullest potential. All right, uh, next uh, council, seeing no further announcements, the next council meeting is scheduled for September 27th, 2021, following the Committee of the Whole. Um, we're moving into closed session now under Section 2392B, Personal Matters about an Identifiable Individual. All right, we need a mover and a seconder to move into closed. Do you want the electronic yeah. statement? First, I'm gonna read the electronic statement. Electronic participation, participation closed session, session statement, statement declaration. declaration. Turn your mic off. Good evening, members of council. Before we begin the closed session, all members are reminded to the that any discussions in the clo in closed are to remain confidential as per our procedural bylaw and our code of conduct for the council of the town of Grinsby. Before we begin, I need each member that is attending electronically to confirm the following that you understand that matters are to remain confidential and confirm that no one else is present with you and confirm that no one else can hear this closed session and confirm that you're not using any electronic devices other than your tablet or computer for the purpose of this video conferencing only and confirm that you're not recording this portion of the meeting. If you acknowledge all of the above, please reply with I understand and confirm to all the statements. Councillor Bothwell. I understand and confirm to all the statements. Councillor Dunstall. I understand and confirm to all the statements. Councillor Freck. I understand and confirm to all the statements. Councillor Cadwell. Understand and confirm to all statements. Councillor Ritchie. Understand and confirm to all the statements. Councillor Sharp. I understand and confirm to all except the electronic devices. Councillor Vane. I understand and confirm all the statements. Councillor Vardy. I understand and confirm to all the statements. Myself, I understand Recording and confirm stopped. to all the statements. All right, we need a mover and seconder to move into close.
Sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, moved by Councillor Bain. Seconder. I'll second. Councillor Dunstall. Moved by Councillor Vane, second by Councillor Dunstall. Resolved that Council meet in closed session regarding the following closed session under Section 2392B personal matters about an identified individual, including municipal or local board employees, committee appointments, uh, and tax information. All in favor to go into closed? Yay. That's carried. Recording in progress.
Recording in progress. Are we live yet? Okay. All right. Welcome back to the people on Zoom. All right. Need a mover and seconder to um, pass the proceedings uh, for the citizen appointments in um, that was done and closed. Councillor Ritchie, Councillor Bain. We have a recorded vote. Yep. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Councillor Frake? No. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Bain? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. Beth Carey? All right, now we move to uh, FIN 2124, property taxes, 135 Livingston Avenue. Melanie? All right, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen here for the presentation. Just give me one moment. Can council see my screen? Yes, all good. Is that still okay? Just so I can keep my notes up here and, and talk through it. Yeah, it's good. All right, so good evening, Council. I wanted to take a few minutes to review some of the key information from the report before you for consideration this evening, just to make sure we're all on the same page. I understand that the property in question has had ongoing discussion with various staff and counselors in the past few years. My goal tonight is simply to ensure that I share the facts with Council as I understand them from my recent research and to ensure Council understands its authority as it relates to the adjusting taxes. So in order to achieve that goal, we're going to go over uh, five key elements this evening. I will summarize the property owner's request. I will outline um, facts from MPAC's position as well as what's happened here at the town. Um, point out the relevant legislation and what council's authority is under that legislation, and then finalize with some considerations and impacts for council to, to consider, um, and then just um, put up the, the motion or the recommendations from staff as we have presented them. So before we get into the facts of the situation, this is what's been requested from the property owner. Um, they have requested that council find a mechanism to reduce the taxes on the assessed clergy residents and to cease collection of all retroactive taxes back to 2017. So um, I think it's important to understand there's two key entities here that we're working with when it comes to tax legislation and how this works. So MPAC sets tax staff. So they determine what properties are exempt, what properties are commercial, residential, all of those different statuses. And they also determine assessment value. And they do this per the Assessment Act. And then the town uses that information that's provided to us to levy taxes based on our tax rates. So in reviewing this current situation, we did have lengthy conversations with MPAC. And we have confirmed the facts or, or, or the information that they're sharing with us. This particular property did have assessment added in 2017 as part of the 2016 year end close and reassessment process. Prior to 2017, this property did not have a clergy residence identified um, on, its, um, on its components to, to the property. So MPAC did discover that in 27, end of 2016, start of 2017, and they did add that assessment onto the property at that time. There have been no assessment appeals or requests for considerations on this property that have been filed with MPAC since then. Um, MPAC has reviewed the status of this account and how the assessment has been determined as well as the taxable components. 
and they do believe it is correct and in accordance with the Assessment Act. So Town of Grimsby's position or what has occurred at Town of Grimsby is we have been levying taxes on this property in alignment with the assessed values provided by MPAC since 2017, actually since, since the start of this property. We have never made an, a historical tax reduction or adjustment on this property. Um, we do have authority to do that in certain circumstances, but there has been no motions passed and no adjustments made to the taxation, as far as I can tell, um, on this property. And the property is receiving the clergy residence exemption, which is 50% of the residential rate on that assessed value for the clergy residence. So since the clergy residence has been added to the, to the property, it has received the 50% exemption. So from 2017 till today. So, sorry, I just wanna keep up with my notes here. So this slide is intended to outline some of the legislative authorities in this situation. So I wanna kind of point out to council here that there's no special provincial, provincial legislation in place for this circumstance. So some might be drawing some parallels to a recent decision we made on uh, the air cadets. And I wanted to make sure that we're making the clear distinction that there was special legislation enacted by the province that received royal assent. And then we followed that legislation. So in this situation, there is no separate legislation that we can follow. So we only have the assessment act and the municipal act to consider as our authorities in making any decisions. So therefore, in this situation, under the Municipal Act, we really only have Section 365 that we can look to as, as to Council's authority or how we can go about adjusting, canceling, reducing taxes. Um, so Section 365 uh, does define that Council can cancel, reduce, or refund taxes. They can only do it in the current year of an application, and they need to do so by way of bylaw. And in that bylaw, they would need to define what, why the taxes are unduly burdensome. So that's very vague, but that is the only requirement in that section of the act is that our bylaw would have to define why the taxes are unduly burdensome. So what are some considerations and impacts in this situation? So. I, I do believe it's important for council to keep clear in their mind that taxable assessment and tax exemption and status typically rests with the province of Ontario and is facilitated through MPAC. That's not something that under the Municipal Act we typically get involved with. We use that information obviously and we levy taxes, but that is the authority of the province and, and is facilitated through MPAC. There are mechanisms in place where a property owner can appeal or challenge MPAC's decisions or assessments. Um, those, those exist um, and they are what we point taxpayers to when there are any concerns. None of those have been utilized in this particular situation since 2017. I also want to reiterate um, the need for council to define unduly burdensome should they wish to um, cancel, reduce, or, or waive any taxes on this property. And I wanted to outline maybe an example or the intent of that language as, as I'm understanding it is usually that this would require some kind of a level of proof of hardship or, or why the taxes are unduly burdensome. So poverty, social assistance, disability or other criteria are often used as examples in, in this situation. Um, and, you know, we would then have to apply similar applications, whatever the criteria we deem as unduly burdensome, if we had similar applications we would want to apply the same criteria. Um, so I think it's important for council to understand that concept um, should they choose to explore that option. And the last consideration I would say for council is it is important to recognize that should we use Municipal Act Section 365, we would be setting a precedent and other properties may start reaching out to the town for similar considerations. So while this current situation it, we're dealing with the property at 137 Livingstone and the clergy residence that is attached to the church is the only clergy residence attached to a church in Grimsby. It is important to note that there are other properties assessed as clergy residences in Grimsby. So while it's not the exact same property structure um, and it's not all under the same roll number, 
the concept of a clergy residence exists beyond just this one property. Um, and then the last piece I will leave council for is just to consider the impacts of any, any decisions or any guidance to utilize this section. This is a shift in tax burden. So I wanna make sure that that's understood that we are, if we choose to enact this section, we are shifting, it doesn't change the amount of tax we need to collect. We still need to collect that tax and we're shifting that burden to other taxpayers. The, the uniqueness of this section is also that we would be required to cover the regional component of the taxes. So normally if we have a tax write-off for any given reason, we share in that equally, the town and the region portion, as well as the education portion. In this particular section of the act, if the town chooses to enact it or utilize it, we would have to cover the regional costs. The region would still collect their taxes and it would be um, shifted to, to the Grimsby taxpayer. So fully imposed on the town. And the last piece I wanna just make sure is, is clear on the impacts is if we do utilize this section of 365, it would only apply to the current year that we're dealing with. So this application or this request has come forward into 2021 formally, and we would only be able to utilize this section in 2021. Um, tax collection would continue for any previous tax years. So that brings us to, to the conclusion and, and staff's recommendations. Um, staff and myself, I, I do believe that we should continue to collect taxes on this property as allowed through the Municipal Act. Should council decide to direct staff otherwise, um, that, that is certainly within your authority under section 365. But I would ask that council give some consideration or guidance to how we want to define unduly burdensome as that is the requirement of the bylaw. And, um, and staff would be required to understand council's intent before we could take any action. And the last piece I, I would note um, in our recommendations is while I do appreciate the sensitivity of the situation that there has been many conversations over the years, um, the, the avenue that is, has always been available is to seek reconsideration from impact and appeal to the assessment review board or obtain a court declaration in accordance with the assessment act. That is typically what we would recommend. That is certainly what I recommended um, when I spoke with this property owner. I, I understand that's not their preference and, and I can appreciate that, but that would be the normal recourse for this type of situation. So with that said, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or clarify any facts as, as I, best I can. Thank you for your presentation, Melanie. Uh, it certainly uh, was informative. Councillor Vane. Actually, no, I don't have any questions for Melanie. I want to speak to the matter. That's why my hand's up. All right, go ahead. You're up first. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> I, I, having had a, this um, situation brought to my attention a couple of times now, I understand what the, um, the um, oh, it, Melanie calls him the property owner, let's all use that term, uh, has said, but what we have to keep in mind is that and the money that he pays out of that church's pocket, let's say, for lack of a better word, is money he has to take away from programs that he runs in the community. I think we have to look, and this is just my personal opinion, I think we have to look at a broader picture here in that that property is used for quite a few things. Uh, he does not come to the town when it's time to redo the parking lot that's used quite frequently by people within the town to go to the park to play whatever or to park for the parade or whatever else um and just e even it's only a couple of thousand dollars i know most people would say what's the big deal well the churches because of the pandemic have been hit just as hard as anybody else they don't have as much money he's got to cut programs if we start going after this money uh, that means people, youth, other people, whoever, um, that depend on the church for help um, are going to be impacted in some way or another. There's 3,000 families that go to this church. Um, and I think there's a lot of benefit to this. And, and it's not just, I, I realize it's a, oh, a single denomination church, but I know that a lot of people outside of that denomination also use the church. So um, I think it's it's something that we should pursue. And uh, I've spoken to Melanie about this, and I've told Melanie this, so I'm not saying anything out of turn here. Um, while I respect everything Melanie says, and I agree, um, she's raised an excellent point, uh, excellent points, 
But um, I do think we need to do this because it's not like they have any other options where to go to get this extra money. People aren't giving as much as they used to. And, and it's just, like I say, we're taking from the directly from the community. I mean, Point of clarification. Is- they do have another option. They have an option to go to MPAC and to follow file an appeal and to do it the, the, the way uh, legislation has provided. So, so that is their option. So they do have an option. I would right. rather look at it after that option is exhausted. So, well, from Counselor. what I'm gathering from what Melanie is saying is that that option is not a viable one. And uh, from having spoken to uh, other people in MPAC and that, it's, it doesn't seem to be a viable option. They're just kind of set in their way. This is the way it's going to be, and that's the way it's got to be. And I, I think this is something that requires a little more thought and a little more um, outside the box thinking, let's say. But anyways, that's just my opinion. I mean, I uh, need to get four others to agree with me. Other than that, that's it. Thank you. And Melanie, thank you so much. I, I'm, I know we've talked about this and I do apologize for not agreeing with you. I do support you 100%. You know that, but I just, this particular- No, no apologies required. I understand. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night, Melanie. Councillor Sharp. Yeah, thanks, Mary Jordan. Um, so a couple of comments to the issue. I want to first point out that this is a rectory and not a manse. Um, the resident who lives here is a priest not a pastor or a minister and they are not married uh, no children and um, therefore there's no school taxes and um, that should be charged to the resident and um, a tax credit gives that money back to the congregation at the church so that they can use it for programs and services to the church Um, i think the fact that it is part of the church building it's actually inside the church it can't be sold separately it's not a house beside the church and that it's occupied by a priest um that we could waive the taxes and we can justify that we what we do and that we don't do it for some other churches because they have separate houses and um there's a potential that a pastor or minister they have a family, so maybe their wife works and earns a living, and and so they we charge 50% tax on, on a clergy residence. And I think that we can define this one differently, A, based on the, um, the priest not having a family, and B, um, sorry, not having a spouse and children, but, um, and that it's, just a, just a point of clarification on that as well. Uh, it, a single person that doesn't have children and um, has a piece of property pays the school taxes. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, thanks, Mayor Jordan. But um, there's a little bit of a difference to me between a priest who's dedicated himself to God and um, is is not having a family for those reasons and a person who just doesn't have a family and um, or a spouse. I mean, there there's significant material difference between the two. Um, some might have a family and, and others don't. And um, so um, then when Melanie made the report, and thank you, Melanie, for the report, she talked about that we would still have to pay the taxes and it kind of gets, it's only $2,000 or something per year. And so it gets spread out on the 11,000 homes in Grimsby. It's like 40 cents a home, but um so either we have to, um, either we can waive those taxes and then we spread it back onto the, the general tax base, or we don't waive the taxes, we charge them, and then the church has to spread it onto the congregation and they have to take it from the plate. But either way, it's the community who's paying for those taxes. So it's, um, so so the argument that like there is, um, that it gets passed back to the taxpayers, either way, it comes back to the community. It's just a matter of whether it comes from the collection plate or whether we can waive it. And there's like legislation or there's an act and in the municipal act, it says um, we can waive those taxes. And so I think for some of the reasons that I've outlined that we can justify why we would waive it. And we, when we talk about um, unduly burdensome to the same point that they're um, the school taxes, like we're, we're charging taxes for a person who doesn't have, children and won't have children and um 
that's all I really wanted to say. I will support the resolution. I will. Sorry. I would support waiving the taxes on this specific property because it is attached to the church. It can't be sold separately. And that it's for a priest's residence, not a not a um, minister or a pastor. Thanks. Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. I think we have to be extremely cautious opening this this door because um, I totally sympathize with this being brought forward by uh, Father Rico at this time. I'm a little concerned that it's been sitting for five years and was or could have been brought to the former council before us and, and wasn't or didn't get dealt with at that time uh, when it was originally assessed. I have a, uh, I understand what um, the director of finance is saying about um, there's no differentiation between uh, with MPAC, um, a residence within a building or a separate residence, they're all still taxable at the same residential component. This property is already exempt for about 1.8 or $2 million for the church property. They're already receiving a tax benefit um, for the church facility itself, of which I believe within the building, the residential component is like, I don't know, Melanie, you might want to confirm for me how many square feet. Was it like 2,100 square feet or something is for the single person living there? Is that the living area? How much was it? So through the mayor, I can confirm that the residential portion is 2,869 square feet. It does include a small garage and it's two levels of a rectory. That's the residential portion and the non-residential or the, the exempt church portion is about 17,000 square feet, just a little bit over. Thank you. So can it's I get a point of clarification, oh, Mr. Mayor? I'm sorry, no, it's, you said something that was incorrect. It's not just a single person. There's, there's sometimes three or four people living there. Okay, at this point, from what I understand, th there's one person living there, but in any event, it's 2,800 square feet. That is, um, I believe MPAC has assessed as a residential component. Um, I think it, what it does is it opens the door to the potential um, with the new type of church style where someone has a big home and they decide that their whole basement theater area is going to be a church and I'm going to operate a church out of my home. I'm, uh, I'm um, a certified pastor or minister to define that only a pastor of a Catholic religion can get this benefit when somebody in a big, huge monster home says, I'm running, I want to get a tax exemption on my residential property because I'm running a church. I'm, an, I'm a, a registered pastor and I want my home now to be partially exempt as well. Is that a potential, Melanie, that someone who runs a church out of their home could also then say we should be treated the same? I think that the crux of the decision here is really how council chooses to define unduly burdensome. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, that is that is vague language in the Municipal Act, and it does give council that flexibility. But however council chooses to define that, I think we have to be really careful because we would then need to apply that same definition to any further applications that would come forward. So we just need to be very specific there to make sure that if, if council does want to do this, it meets their intent. And, and I, I guess personally, I'm struggling in how we would define that. If we're just defining the concept of a clergy residence, there are more clergy residences outside of this property. Absolutely, I can understand that they're not in the same situation, priest, rectory attached to the building. I, I understand those factors, but the, the concept of a clergy residence, if that's what we're looking to exempt, um, we would need to kind of outline that a little bit. So it really does come back to that definition. And we can, you know, if council does want to do this, we can seek some legal advice here on how best to define that. But I would suggest, based on my opinion and, and what I've looked at so far, it might be difficult to just box this property in um, with that definition if, if we're following the intent and the way the Municipal Act is worded. We could certainly attempt to, but I, I, I we need some legal advice on how to do that and what council is really trying to do with this um, bylaw. Thank you. And um, currently, the the assessment is already fit, reduced by fifty percent only on the residential portion. Like I said, the one point eight or two million the church is worth is already exempt, and the town is already giving um, the clergy the fifty percent benefit on the assessment, right? So I'd That's like correct. to, thank you, Melanie. I'd like to put 
um, uh, amendment or a motion forward that we do refer this to legal again to review further what the definition of, as Melanie said, unduly burdensome is and whether this opens the door to uh, potential future um, uh, requests and how we would handle those. So can I just add some clarity here just to make sure I get enough to actually be able to action this? Yeah. So we have gotten a legal opinion on this section of the act prior to this conversation today to make sure that I understood it properly, that there were no other options, that I, I, I was guiding counsel in the right direction. So they did say um, that, yes, this is the only section that's applicable that counsel could use for 2021 forward should they, should they choose to. And they could help us craft something um, in, in, in how we would define unduly burdensome, but I do need some direction more than just refer back to legal. I, I, I need to know what counsel's intent is, if it, in what their goal is in the exemption to make sure that what I propose to legal, we, we flush that out accordingly. Um, I, I don't know if it's just clergy residences, if it's just this property, Again, what the definition of unduly burdensome that council wants to see in, enacted in this bylaw, I, I would need some direction in order to be able to do this properly. And it's only one year we can deal with anyway, right, at this point, and we would, but whatever motion we would pass would be moving forward, it would be for this year and forward. Um, so I guess it's, um, as per your we need to define unduly burdensome for inclusion in the bylaw. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a little at a loss too. how to direct Melanie here on this one. <laughs> All right, Councillor Cadwell. Thank you, uh, Mayor Jordan. Thank you, Melanie, for the report. I'm just reading again through your staff recommendations. So under the third point, the uh, property owner be encouraged to seek a reconsideration. So they haven't taken that step at all, uh, like an appeal at all, Melanie? Is that correct? That, that's correct uh, through you, Mayor Jordan. So we have talked to the property owner and we have talked to MPAC. And while they've had some conversations with MPAC staff, again, nothing documented. They never filed an appeal and they never put any documentation forward in any of the years in question. And that's pretty much a fairly common practice for somebody that isn't happy with an assessment. They, they file an appeal and they haven't done that. That that's correct. That is my understanding, and that's certainly the mechanism we recommend. Um, talking with the property owner, I understand there was lots of different information being shared, and there, there may have been some confusion at, at different points in time. But that that has always been an option, um, and that is generally um, certainly what I would recommend, and it is what I recommended in July when I spoke with the property owner. And I've heard uh, a financial number, maybe around a couple thousand dollars. That's for the town, but what about what about a, a regional uh, rebate? How much would we have to, uh, you know, as the region has to be rebated too, don't they? That's correct. So if we choose to enact this section, we would have to cover the full valuation of the tax, which includes the town portion and the regional portion. Um, I can just get an estimate here. Of, That'd be great, Mel. Uh, the town portion is is generally smaller. The region portion is generally larger. Yeah. Um, I can crunch the numbers real quick, but I'm going to suggest the town portion is typically around 30% and the regional portion is the remainder and, and a small portion for education. But I'll confirm the percentages for you. Yeah, that'd be great. That's very helpful for me too on my decision making. Yeah, great. Thanks, Melanie. <clears throat> Councillor Bain. Um, I just want to clarify some stuff um, and, and not to um, correct anything Melanie said. Everything she said is correct. The only thing that I got a little bit of history on, uh, and, and I think Melanie said something about being confused. Um, when I first heard this story, there was a lot of history there uh, with the former council, specifically the mayor. Uh, there was also a history with the former treasurer who knew the priest personally. And so the priest was led to believe that this was going to be dealt with within the town. Uh, I know the priest has also contacted a number of members of this council who all agreed they would help him. And now I'm seeing some of them questioning it. 
Um, so, I mean, the priest is only doing what he is led to believe. He's not a politician. He's a priest. So he's being led to believe that we as the town, and I'm saying we collectively, not you, Melanie, I'm sorry. <laughs> this was the previous uh, treasurer who said to him, oh, hello, Father Rico. I am, you know, such and such. And I used to go to your church when you were in Niagara Falls and blah, blah, blah. So he has been led down this garden path for five years. So for us to sit here and say, yeah, now just send them to MPAC. Yeah, that's always been an option. But I, I think we're being a little unfair here at this point. Like, you know, we, we can't keep saying to this, this gentleman or this priest, oh, okay, we'll try this now. And if that doesn't work, then come back. We're, we're affecting families here. We're affecting families within our community, not just Ward 4 where he's located, Every single ward, every corner of this town, 3,000 families are in some way or another going to suffer if we continue to drag this out. We need to make a decision. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Councillor Sharp. Thanks, Mayor Jordan. So I just wanted to, this is from my recollection, but the town portion of our tax bill is around 28% and the region portion is around 57% and the school board portion is around 15%. So about 72% goes to the region and school board and 28% comes to the town. And that was last year with when the taxes change, it's like it adjusts by a, a small margin, but we're roughly 28, 57 and 15. So the tax bill for that residence is in the neighborhood of $2,200. So the town portion is like 600. Um, the region portion is eight, 1,300 or something, and the school board is three or 400, I don't know. But um, so we would have to cover that, but we would essentially just spread it out over the entire rest of the tax base. I mean, there's 11,000 homes in town. And so it's not, a lot and I think that this property is unique in the ways that I mentioned before and and I would suggest maybe we could get our lawyer to confirm um, when we define unduly burdensome that um, it is only occupied by by clergy and um, no family of the clergy so um, so in, the, in this uh, rectory so you have the priest who doesn't have a wife and kids and then there might be some other clergy that live there and mentor i don't know exactly how how that works but but maybe there's two to three members of the church living there but there's not um family just a point of clarification councillor sharp because you mentioned me, Jordan, you just let me it's a moot point because because please just let me finish me, Jordan. I'm sorry it's your opinion that it's moot but i i'd like not to an opinion please. it's a fact but I'll Mayor, let you go. Please, yes, thank you. Um, so then the fact that um, if we include in that definition only occupied by, by clergy, then um, it would, well, like I'm saying, when we're talking unduly burdensome, some of the taxes that we pay to the region is for certain social services and um, school taxes, etc. that the priest does not use. And... Um, and so we're making, essentially, we're making the congregation pay it for, for their priest, who doesn't who doesn't use that. And so instead, we just spread it on the entire tax base. And um, it's a small amount. Uh, you can confirm the numbers, but they were around 2,200. 300 was kept on for the garage and shed, but I think that's 1,900 dollars, like to spread on a 15 million dollar tax base. Like it's, it's a quarter per year from every home i'm like you could find it in your couch cushions so um so when we're talking about we have to spread the whole cost on on them it's it's a very very small amount and um every dollar counts though but um i would support defining this as a residence occupied only by clergy and attached to the church building and I think that would make it different. And I think that it would prevent other churches from, it would allow us to say no to other properties that might 
ask for the same thing when they're already getting their current arrangement. Thanks. Just before I call Councillor Cadwell, CAO, I just have a question. Um, is is it like, uh, have you heard of other occurrences where a muni municipality overrules MPAC? For you, Mayor, in my experiences in 20 years or so, I've never uh, encountered this. Usually, you know, the, the individual applies through the proper channels and moves forward that way. We have never Great. seen that. Right. Great, thank you. That's, that's what I thought, thanks. Councilor Cadwell. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. I'll be quick. I guess where I'm having some difficulty is under Section 365 is the uh, unduly burdensome criteria. You know, I'm thinking, is it a financial thing? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm having some, some difficulty trying to uh, pinpoint uh, a definition to support the church on that uh, unduly burdensome criteria. So anyway, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Councillor Frank. Mayor Jordan, I just want to call the question. All right. Where's the resolution? This is the original. Yeah. Yeah. Just need a mover and seconder for the original resolution. Move by Councillor Vane. Seconder. Councillor Cadwell. I'll read the resolution. Mayor Jordan. Um, yes. Can can I make no. Um, the oh, question has yeah. been called. Moved by Councillor Vane. Well, it has by Councillor Cadwell. Yes, it has. Nuh uh Okay, we have to vote on the calling of the question. All right, let's vote oh. on the calling of the question. Can I make a resolution to amend? No, the, the question has been called. We're, What's uh, the, clerk? To the clerk? To the clerk, what comes first, um, an amendment or a call of the question? Call the question. Yeah, to you, Mr. Mayor, yes. Thank you. So we have uh, Councillor Frake calling the question. We have a seconder, Councillor Vardy. Recorded vote. Moved by Councillor Frank, second by Councillor Vardy. Resolved that the item on report FIN 2124 be called to question. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell. Councillor Bothwell. Yes. Councillor Dunstone. Yes. Councillor Frank. Yes, yes. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? No. Councillor Sharp? No. Councillor Vane? No. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's carried. All right, moved by Councillor Vane, second by Councillor Cadwell, result of constant. Confidential, confidential report FIN 2126 property taxes 135 Livingston Avenue dated September 7th, 2021 be received for information and the report FIN 2124 property taxes 135 Livingston Avenue dated August 23rd, 2021 be received for information that staff continue to pursue collections of taxes owing on 135 Livingston Avenue as allowed through the Municipal Act. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Councillor Frake? Yes. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? No. Councillor Vane? No. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's carried.
All right, mover and seconder to introduce uh, confirming bylaws. Councillor Ritchie, Councillor Sharp. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second, second by Councillor Sharp. Resolved that they be given to introduce bylaw 2171 and the same we read a first time. All in favor? Yay. That's carried. Councillor Frank, do you have your hand up? I wanted to ask a question if I could vote against confirming bylaw. Well, you should, if, if you had to ask for a recording vote, recorded vote, so if you want to um, vote against the second and third. Uh, I my that, hand up. All right. Well, let, need a mover and seconder for the second and third. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Bothwell. Uh, recorded vote. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll read it first. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Bothwell. Resolved that leave be given to introduce bylaw 2171, read a first time, now be read a second time and third time, and finally passed. And the mayor and town clerk do sign, sign and seal the, the same, same, and, and the rule of council to the contrary notwithstanding. Recorded vote. Yep. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Councillor Frake? No. Councillor Cowell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Bain? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's carried. All right. Our next meeting is uh, September 27th at 6 p.m. And this meeting is adjourned. Good night. Good night, everybody. Record.